Uh, thank you for coming to tonight's uh, meeting, uh, City Council of Monday, October 24th, 2022. I would first await a uh, motion to exit non-public and to seal the minutes. So moved. moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Um, and then um, we'll take a, a roll call for tonight's meeting. Mayor McEachran? Here. Assistant Mayor Kelly? Here. Councilor Tabor? Here. Councilor Denton? Here. Councilor Moreau? Here. Councilor Bagley? Here. Councilor Lombardi? Here. Councilor Blaylock? Here. Councilor Cook? Here. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, for those watching at home, we had some strobing light issues. It's not a Halloween uh, thing, We're keeping the lights low here. Um, but for the invocation, I'd like to ask uh, Councilor Denton to, to speak on uh, the upcoming uh, uh, Veterans Day celebrations. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, so for people who do not know, Veterans Day is on November 11th. It's going to be the second Friday of the month in November. Uh, the Central Veterans Committee, which is made up of the American Legion, the VFW, the Marine Corps League, uh, will be hosting the annual Veterans Day ceremony at 11 o'clock in Goodwin Park. Uh, the ceremony itself is usually relatively short. Uh, I had asked and he had accepted to be our keynote speaker. That's um, Major General David Michaelides, who's both a Portsmouth resident and the Adjutant General of the New Hampshire National Guard. And for anyone who doesn't know what that means, it means he's the top uniformed officer of the National Guard in New Hampshire. And after the ceremony, uh, many of us go to the American Legion to celebrate. So if you're able to attend on Friday, November 11th at 11 o'clock in Goodwin Park, it'd be great to have you there. And if you're not able to attend that event or any event for Veterans Day, uh, just simply thank a veteran for their service uh, on that day or any day. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Josh, for your service and Council Lombardi uh, for your service. Um, with that, I'd like to ask you to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the, to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have no minutes to accept, but as always, Kelly, thank you for your diligent work on preparing those. Um, no recognitions um, of volunteer and committee reports. Um, and next up, uh, we have public comment. So uh, before we speak tonight um, on public comment, um, I'd just like to, we're going to have a discussion on public comment uh, a little later on. I strongly believe uh, in public comment. Uh, I think it's incredibly important to to be able to speak to uh, your government and your elected officials. Um, I would ask uh, as much as is possible uh, to be respectful in the comments uh, that you make and to speak with the respect that, um, you know, not uh, myself, um, but this chamber uh, deserves. I, it's incredibly hard to sit here, and it's my, it's my job as chair, um, with the gavel um, to decide uh, when people cross the line and get into personal attacks. And to be honest, most of the time, I, I err on the side of probably uh, too much um, because I like to, I like to imagine that, that we all come looking to uh, make a better government uh, together. Um, so when we get up to speak, you know, if there are personal attacks, I would ask that you direct them to me as the, as the chair rather than the rest of the council doesn't have the gavel and certainly not to staff. Um, you know, the only uh, person that, that works for us in the council is the, the city manager um, and the rest of the staff, they, they work for her. Um, and so when we do that, um, it's, it just doesn't create the, the type of atmosphere that I think that, that we want to be proud of. Um, you have uh, a privilege to speak, a privilege that was started with a former assistant mayor, Jim Splain. Um, I believe it's a good one. Uh, but I'd ask that you respect the, uh, the hall when we're speaking 
uh, so that we can move forward um, and and create a better government and 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 honor the city that we all love. So, uh, with that, uh, we have uh, up first uh, Nicole Lapierre uh, with the topic of the neighborhood parking program. That that's a hard statement to followers. Oh, this. sorry, and that wasn't directed to anything. No, no, in terms I know. Of, I just. Um, <laughs> but feel free to come at me. At, as I feel much bad. I I <laughs> am more than cognizant of the fact that the work you do is uh, hard and without thanks, often without any thanks and long hours. So I appreciate that, and I also work for a municipality, so I do as well feel for the people who are employed by the city. So thank you, and it's disappointing to hear that you have to even say that. But um, back to, I guess, the matter at hand. So uh, again, I am Nicole Pierre. I live at 44 Rock Street. Um, I missed the last uh, PTS meeting due to its 8.30 timing. It's difficult if you work. It's a hard time to get there. I had hoped to go. Um, regarding the data for the NPP, um, previous uh, and I don't know if everyone knows this, previous pre-pandemic data was collected by a survey of the neighborhood, and it did 100% show that the majority of residents in favor were in favor of the parking program. And I, I believe, Councillor Bigley, I'm not 100%, um, might have that information, and if so, I'd encourage him to share it with the group, or maybe there's some way we could get it to uh, councillors that are new and weren't on the council or working for the city at the time that effort was made. Because it, it, it paints part of an important picture. So the issue regarding um, the recent data we have been hearing so much about is that it was collected during the pandemic and I see it, the problem as it skews that data and fails to give a clear picture of what exp people experienced before. So as people are returning to restaurants, just what feels like recently anyways, returning to restaurants and places of business, et cetera, um, with a, without a program, I feel like we're gonna be right back where we, where we started off pre-pandemic. I also believe there is absolutely a correlation between the announcement of the pilot and pe people taking advantage of the workers' rates in Foundry Garage. So when the pilot ends, and if nothing else is in its place, uh, the people paying to park will leave the garage and return to the streets. And I think that because, for example, if you work in hospitality, the hospitality industry with the price of inflation right now, I mean, groceries alone, why wouldn't you save yourself that money? And so the city, in my opinion, needs proactive governing. And with continued development, for example, the state micro apartments and the Deer Street Associate, Associates planning residential development, the problem is sure to compound even more and be an even bigger issue. And there is uh, very little off-street parking planned for those two developments. And where will all these new people park? Uh, the way the foundry was bonded, sa sadly bonded, the developers cannot buy spots. It has to be individuals. So there is, in my opinion, zero incentive for those new residents to buy passes. Because if I've learned one thing living in Islington Creek, it's that if you can park for free, you park for free. So the congestion of those developments alone will once again push this to the forefront. Um, parking programs are used all over the country. It's not a novel idea or an unreasonable one. In my, okay, just very quickly, sure. in, in my opinion, the NPP did work. It was successful in its intent, making a neighborhood a neighborhood again. And the problem has been solved. I really would be regretful to see it back. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, next up is Michelle Worth. Worth? Uh, on the topic of the neighborhood parking plan program. Good evening, Michelle Worth, 439 Hanover Street. Also speaking about the neighborhood parking program. Uh, several years ago, before the pandemic, um, a group of neighbors got together and wanted to start a parking program because even though they lived on the edge of downtown Portsmouth, they were frustrated that they couldn't have the parking space right in front of their house. Um, the city mandated they find a, um, they get 75% of the neighbors in order to sign on to the pilot in order to run it. They could not do that. They did not get 75%. We didn't want it. But through all of the strangeness of the pandemic, they did manage to finally push through their pilot program. 
The studies, the original studies show that the parking situation in our neighborhood does not meet the criteria that the parking department would usually use to make a parking program. It currently has lower than that threshold. After the city has spent more than $100,000 to measure the parking in the lot, the Please listen very carefully to Mr. Fletcher as he presents the findings. I believe it was only a 2%, two or three parking spaces were gained. That's all it was for the price of $100,000. This is not an appropriate use of city tax money, of my tax money. Um, it has been suggested that each of the neighbors be charged a fee in order to park in our own neighborhood after we've already paid taxes to create this, the uh, streets. Um, and for all of the inclusion and equity talk of the, the council, it is not right in our neighborhood with all of the apartments that we have to allow my affluent neighbors who all have single family homes and driveways to park for free while all of my neighbors that live in apartments all have to pay a fee to park in the street. And that's not right to charge extra fees and taxes to the poorer people and of our community. It's not right. We talk about equity. So please be very careful to pay attention to the numbers and understand that this program costs a lot of money and makes no significant difference to the parking in our neighborhood. Please vote no on the parking program. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, next up is Esther Kennedy, the topics of audit committee and rule 43. Oh, Esther's not here. Okay. Uh, next up is Peter Huda uh, on Audit Committee and Rule 43. Good evening, Mayor, City Council. Peter Huda, 280 South Street. So I'm here to talk to you about the Audit Committee again. Um, seems you have run out of the out of options to keep the old city management hold on the audit process. The audit committee was challenged every step of the way, not having information available for meetings, fostering the staff taking control over the audit committee process, then compromising the process last year by engaging with proposers during the election process and attempting to put the, the blame on the audit committee chair by abstaining from a required vote. This year, after the audit committee spent two years updating, evaluating, and voting on an RFP, the staff was allowed to disregard the whole RFP and then post a staff RFP without even a final review by the audit committee. Good governance. The governance committee attempted to change the audit members, commemor audit members' terms, failing on that. Then Councillor Cook and Tabor proposed removing the independent financial experts totally when that was met with strong resident and taxpayer resistance, now we come to this. Now you're attempting to put another non-financial city councilor on the audit committee. You're making an unprecedented change to only the ordinance, only this audit committee ordinance by dictating that a city councilor shall be appointed by the mayor to be chair, unlike any other committee that chose their own chairman. Why the audit committee only? As a resident and taxpayer of Portsmouth, who you as a city council report to, why do you continue the blatant assault on the audit committee and its chair? As mayor and councilors, please ask yourself, does this change remove the most qualified and duly appointed person as audit committee chair and replace him with a city councilor with little or no experience in the audit process serve the residents and taxpayers best? Or is this just another political move as described by councillors Lombardi and Tabor to influence the real financial status of the city? This process also begs the, the question, does dictating by ordinance that the chair of only the audit committee best serve the people of Portsmouth now and into the future? Or is this council just putting a rubber stamp on the city management directive? You will be dictating, will you be dictating that other boards and committees have a city councilor on their chair. A lot of the other committees, i.e. Uh, trustees of the trust, handle a lot of money, advise you on a lot of money. There's not a councilor on there. Are you going to dictate that that goes on there too? 
So I ask you, please think about what you're doing here tonight. It's, it is setting a precedent, and it's not just you. It's all councils into the future. Thank you. Thank you, Petra. Uh, next up uh, is uh, Chris White on the subject of the audit committee. Good evening. I'm Chris White, currently chair of the Audit Committee. I live at 28 Porter Street. Thank you, Mayor McEachern and City Councilors for the opportunity to speak with you tonight. There was some confusion regarding the Audit Committee at the last City Council meeting. Two matters seem to arise. Why do we need an Audit Committee when the City has a AAA rating? And secondly, there are only two auditing firms available to us in New Hampshire. Both are an error. The AAA rating pertains only to the issuance of bonds. The rating agency's work is quite cursory, especially when compared with the work of the auditors. But the rating agencies don't look at the underlying auditing issues of risk management and internal controls. This entails a far more rigorous examination of the city's finances. The Audit Committee is essential for the procurement of these services no less than the U.S. Government Accountability Office, the U.S. GAO, and our own Government Finance Officers Association, the GFOA, recommend that municipalities establish and use audit committees. When should audit committees be reaffirmed or established? I recommend that now is the time so that our AAA rating might be better protected. Secondly, there is a far more, there is far more, there are far more than two auditing firms available in New Hampshire. There are two which are domiciled in New Hampshire, Mellinson and Plodzik and Sanderson, but there are many more that have their regional headquarters in New England and are licensed to do business in New Hampshire. We had one of these bid on last year's RFP. Now to the new ordinance. By passing this ordinance, you further reduce the Audit Committee's independence. Why not leave well enough alone? You have an audit committee where experience and sound financial judgment informs its work and its recommendations to you. You can take the recommendations or leave it. What more do you want? With your proposed changes, the audit committee becomes political, always looking over its shoulder to see what the council might say. That clouds the judgment of what should be a technical decision. You, by doing this, you've lost plausible deniability because you can't just blame the audit committee the way you did earlier this year. You will be on the hook for process violations, such as what occurred even this last Friday when in public session, again, Councillor Tabor divulged non-public information regarding how many proposals the city had received in response to the latest RFP. As the current chair, I cannot tell you that we have found any specific examples of fraud. But I can tell you we have observed the city ignoring its own internal controls. This loss of internal controls should be of direct concern to you because without robust internal controls, the guardrails for sound financial management and budgetary practice have been removed. Fraud is the stepchild of such behavior, and with this new ordinance, you have provided the grease to make this happen more easily. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman White. Uh, next up is Sue Potadora on the topic of the audit committee, the audit ordinance. Hi, good evening, Sue Polidora, Middle Street, Portsmouth, and I'm here to talk about the ordinance that you're going to be voting on tonight. Now, that ordinance had been read, so this is supposed to be the third reading of it. It has been changed every single time it has been read, and not by a little, it's been changed considerably. So it's no longer that original ordinance that was proposed. And then the public comments were closed, so you have not heard, not, you have not allocated time for a public hearing to go with it. This is totally, how can, how can you say that you're going to have three readings on an ordinance that was changed on the last meeting and the meeting before that and the meeting before that is not the same. I urge you to stop this, just leave things the way they are. This ordinance doesn't look to me like it was appropriately handled 
or voted on. Every time you change something that considerably should go back to the first reading and should be starting the process all over again. I mean, you know that. I'm not telling you something that is new. Everybody here considered them to be very smart. So I have reviewed all of the videos and there was a, a, a time that everybody was so confused, nobody really knew what they were voting on. You know that, you were here. You know, I, I watched it and watched it and I'm like, I'm confused, I don't know what it is. So if you're not sure, please do not vote on this tonight. Please shelve it, come back with the new ordinance if you have to, follow the process and make sure it is what you want it to be the first time around so you don't have to change it every single time to the point that we don't know what we really are voting on and the consequences of it. That's my request, I thank you very much. Thank you, Sue. Next up is Paige Trace on the topic, Portsmouth. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I promise this will be cordial. There Always will be no one maligned, you. no one personally spoken of. Um, the city works on an issue of trust trust between the residents and the city council, trust between the city council and the residents. When the residents are told that a drawing will be included that won't change, everything's agreed upon and suddenly the drawing is different and the residents have trusted the city council. That's where the issues of trust come in. And I realize that we're all overworked and we all spend long hours. But currently, the documents that are in the agenda are changed. Not by intent, but they are changed in the height of the zoning regulations. Nonprofits, 501c3s were promised that there would be no zoning changes in height, particularly the Moffat Ladd House and Garden. And unfortunately, there is a change at the top of the garden. And I'm hoping that this was simply oversight. It's not the only 501c3 that has an issue at the moment. So I am hoping that we can all work together, nonprofits, city council, members of Portsmouth, members of staff, everyone can work together and we can work as a trusting community. And I thank you very much all for your time. Thank you, Paige. Good night. Good night. Um, we'll go back, I saw Esther uh, come in the room. Esther. You are speaking, or uh, proposed to speak on the topic of audit committee and rule 43. Sorry everyone for being late. Esther Kennedy, 41 Pickering F, doing my own budget at the school. Um, so I'm here tonight to talk about the potential of rule 43 coming forward. And I hear many of you speak about transparency. So I guess I'm hoping that Rule 43 that Mr. Badley is coming forward with will offer, give more opportunities for public speaking and not less. But I also wanna throw in there the audit committee. People have been talking about it, nice job. Um, but again, it's getting the citizens involved. It's having them come to the table. I'm not sure what the need was to change the audit committee I thought it was a, a great procedure. I do agree with Ms. Polidora that it has been manipulated many times since the second reading when we had an opportunity to speak as a public. So I asked Attorney Merrill if it was substantially changed, which I believe it was, from the time we had our public hearing. So in having public comment, I would hope that we would go back and have a second public hearing on that. Lastly, I'd like to talk about the CIP committee that's under Councilor, or Mayor McEachern's name. 
I have to ask why are we putting that down? Is it because in the land use board, Ms. Merrill and the city manager, Council Merrill and the city manager, um, we're talking about having a CIP committee? Is it because we want to do it at 10 o'clock in the morning and not in the evening? The planning board has a process, folks. It has public comment, it has allowed time, it's after work hours, and they have a really good process. I would be saddened to see that the city come up with a committee that has people that are assigned to it, quote unquote, that really aren't vetted by the public to put on it. It's our friends and neighbors and the people that might be um, wanting to have more development, which you all know I'm not for, might be um, having um, different values and norms and that I don't have an opportunity to speak. And then this committee comes to the planning board and says at the planning board, we have public input. I guess I would ask you all to really look at our CIP process. It's a good process. It goes in front of the planning board and they get to make a decision and then it comes to you and you get to make a decision. During that time, I usually get an opportunity to speak three times at least. So I would encourage you to think about that. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. Uh, going to the Zoom, I see one hand, Mr. Ken Goldman. Okay, can you hear me? Loud and clear, Ken. Okay, thank you for this uh, opportunity to speak. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, I'm gonna talk to you tonight about the um, neighborhood parking program in Islington Creek. Uh, first, I'd like to um, mention that, that survey that was mentioned earlier. It was a flawed survey. The first, there was no question, do you, like to serve, do you like the program, do you not like the program? It was like, what do you like about the program? So it was changed later on, but at that point, a lot of people had responded. So uh, it, the, the results are really suspect. Okay, so I've, I've spoken and written to you about this many times, and I'm, I'm gonna, so you've heard a lot of this stuff before, but I'm gonna go again. Okay, this was initially a six month pilot program which has now lasted more than a year. Pilot programs are tests or feasibility studies and are not intended to be permanent. Uh, one pilot program option is always to discontinue the program based on the results. The parking department's data on the NPP has consistently shown that the program was neither necessary or effective. This was born of anecdotes, not data. Um, the, um, in the, um, and if you look at your notes for the meeting, the parking, uh, the parking department says, parking industry best practices suggest mitigation measures be explored when occupancy reaches 85% or above, while Islington Creek neighborhood has for years, for years not exceeded 75%. Um, since the data indicates that the NPP is neither necessary nor effective, it should be ended. If the NPP is ended, there is no cost to the city, and therefore no need to charge for parking in Islington Creek. Metered parking using the Park Mobile app would be inconvenient and expensive for some residents, people working at houses and visitors, especially overnight visitors. Uh, going forward, everyone who parks in the neighborhood would need to download the Park Mobile app and set up an account. Um, with visitors and workers, the cost could quickly mount up, and, and why would we do that? And here are some questions I asked you before in an email and I'd like to repeat. Does Islington Creek have the most severe parking problem of all the neighborhoods in the city of Portsmouth? If not, why would you consider imposing the cost and continue, continued inconvenience of this program on the residents of this neighborhood? Is there any compelling reason, any compelling reason to have an NPP or muted parking in Islington Creek? And why would you continue to single out Islington Creek for a neighborhood parking program and now potentially metered parking, despite the data presented by the parking department consistently showing that the NPP is not necessary and has been ineffective? I do not understand the reason why there's potentially a proposal to replace the NPP metered parking. I understand the program is expensive to implement, but if there is no program, there is no cost to the city. The city does not want to bear the cost of the Islington Creek MPP, and neither do I. Why should we pay for a program that the parking department's data has consistently shown to be neither necessary nor effective? Uh, thank you very much. 
Thank you, Ken. Right, no other hands and no other speakers. Oh, sure. Yep. Zelita, come forward. Thanks for allowing me to speak. Zelita Morgan, Richards Avenue. Uh, counselors, uh, I would like to speak tonight about one CIP. Um, I don't know what the mayor is going to propose, uh, what the announcement is going to be, but I think we all need to keep in mind that um, the CIP process has um, is regulated. You, they follow RSA, and I want to make sure that whatever is proposed is not going to create um, conflict or compete with the um, duties of our planning board in executing the CIP process. And it's not going to uh, create like, a burden in another 10 o'clock in the morning meeting, right? Um, I want to speak about the audit committee. Um, when I was here last, and it was a late night, uh, you were going to make one revision with the two counselors, and that was going to be brought, and it seems that all things have evolved, evolved, evolved. So it, it, it re really, I'm surprised. So it raised the question about your process. What is it that you are trying to accomplish? It was very simple, an audit committee, like any other committee, right? To bring recommendations to you, for you to decide, make your decisions. And suddenly this committee has become, you know, historically one thing over the other. We have three residents, highly capable, competent experts in the field. They are here to serve our community. And I would expect to be, they to be honored. It's an honor for us to have such expertise representing us. And I don't see a reason why this committee would be in a way singled out to have one council, one of you, to chair the committee. It seems odd. And again, it raises questions about your own process. And I think you're not, you're not giving clarity, really. It seems to be a power control and not really an inefficient process of here it is, we have these, this is information, RFPs, you vote and move on, right? But clearly having the same company for 27 years is not okay. Um, and then under Rule 43, or 53, I can't remember, um, I'm a strong advocate of public comments. I have sat where you are and I have seen many different um, behaviors. But I have to say I've never seen a behavior like last year at the outgoing council, you know, like people saying things through Zoom meetings that were, I'm sorry, through Zoom meetings that really obnoxious, telling the outgoing council to, um, you know, suck it up or say, someone hysterically screaming like things about, you know, I did not vote for you, whatever the case might be. I mean, you go on, right? You go on. You've got to, you've got to protect this space. This is a space the residents have to come and speak with you and speak their minds. Sometimes we are not going to enjoy. Sometimes we are not going to like it. But nonetheless, there is always a lesson for us, for you sitting there as you listen to your constituents. Maybe there is a clarification that you owe to the community. Maybe there is a learning on that to take from that. So I really would like you to be cautious about it, um, thoughtful, above all, conscientious, that this is a privilege a privilege and a responsibility and a duty, and it's our right. And you should not infringe on that. Thank you, Zalita. Thank you so much. All right. Um, Mayor, you have one more person in the audience raising their hand. Oh, come on up, Craig. I think that's Craig, the beautiful white hair. I can tell, <laughs> even with the lights dim back here. 
<laughs> That's me. You can see me coming. Thank you, Mayor um, and Council. My name is Craig Welch. Next week I'll celebrate my 10th year uh, as the Executive Director of the Portsmouth Housing Authority, and I'm really proud to be in this role um, in such a, a great city and working with all of you. Um, over the past several months, um, our uh, board and staff have been working on a housing needs assessment um, that uh, for the City of Portsmouth with the idea of uh, getting an idea about uh, population growth and future um, housing trends and uh, we have recently released that report and I'm just here to give you a copy a, a paper copy of that and uh, and encourage you to, to look through it I think the obviously uh, the biggest finding is that we've uh, underbuilt housing uh, in this city for some time uh, the result being that we've had a dramatic increase in rents over the years this is not um, a problem that's exclusive to Portsmouth but is going on around the country uh, but I think here in Portsmouth with our uh, creative energy and our collective effort that we can do something about it um, and uh, and continue to add to the supply of affordable housing uh, here in the city um, I, I also we are celebrating um, the completion of Ruth Lewin Griffin place as you know uh, this was many years in the making a lot of people say that nothing ever gets done nothing ever happens um, around affordable housing but we've got a 50,000 square foot building downtown uh, that's now housing 93 people um, that uh, um, proves that uh, we actually are making progress. Uh, Ruth's Place is the largest expansion of permanently affordable housing in the city of Portsmouth in almost a half a century. Um, we worked very hard to do it and, uh, and t took a lot of help from, uh, from the community and city staff and our elected leaders. Um, I just thought for your interest, uh, you might like to know that uh, the final census uh, at Ruth's Place, like I said, 93 people. Um, we do have seven city employees that are living there, four from the school department, several from nonprofits like Seacoast Community School, Seacoast Repertory Theater, Chase Home, I Got Bridged, and others, three separate hair salons, a couple grocery stores, uh, six restaurants, and four hotels. There's also uh, 21 children uh, living at Ruth's Place right now, and when you think about it, it's really a spectacular uh, place to, uh, to live. The, um, the, the big um, data point there, though, is not for the people that are living there. It's for the 270 people that remain on the wait list uh, for Ruth's Place. So while the 64 units um, there uh, were celebrating, uh, there's a significant demand for more. Uh, one of the things in the housing study, the most one of the most notable things is that um, not just that there's a demand for housing, but the people who are already in Portsmouth are severely cost burdened. Mo there's a, a huge percentage of people that are paying more than 30 percent um, of their income and in rent and uh, there's 15 percent of people in Portsmouth that are actually spending um, more than 50 percent of their income and in rent which is really debilitating um, so a lot of times we're talking about housing from uh, uh, people moving inside but there's a lot of people who are here uh, that are severely cost burdened anyway um, there's a lot of effort we've talked to many of you about um, adding to the supply and what the city can do to help uh, and our board and our staff uh, are standing by and uh, and ready to go uh, on our next development. So we're, we'd be delighted to uh, continue to work with you. Thank you. And and Greg, oh please, can I? Uh, you just bring them to me, and I can hand them down. Beth can hand them all out. And, and while you're doing that, I'd say one of the the happiest moments uh, that I've had either on uh, this council, the previous council, uh, was running into a. Uh, a DPW worker that I went to school with that I played Little League with and he told me Dig when I got in and I said to what and he said to Ruth Griffin apartments uh, he was just over the moon that he could stay and live in Portsmouth and you know we got to make sure that that story is not uncommon uh, so thank you for all you do Craig excellent thank you thank you all all right anybody else Okay, we will move on to our next um, topic of conversation, public hearings and vote on ordinances and or resolution. Uh, the first is uh, first reading of ordinance amending chapter one, article four, commission and authorities, section 1.412, public art review committee and way to sample motion, move to pass first reading and schedule a public hearing and second reading at the November 14th, 2022 City Council meeting. So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? 
We did speak to this uh, at the last uh, council meeting. Um, uh, Councilor Cook, would you like to add anything? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, uh, I'm just noting that this is the first of two ordinances that re are related to public art that we're looking at tonight. And this particular ordinance is new. So this is the new ordinance that would establish a public art review committee. And I'm happy to answer any questions from the governance that the, the governance committee had a pretty thorough discussion. So um, I'm happy to answer questions on that. And um, our deputy city manager, Suzanne Woodland, is here as well to answer questions if anyone has any. Thank you, Councilor Cook. Councilor Tabor. Uh, Councilor Cook's given the play-by-play. -play. I'll just add some color commentary. Um, Fitting for the <laughs> Public Art <laughs> Review Committee. This is uh, really uh, replacing what ArtSpeak did in the past. And uh, as you know, we have the 1% uh, for art <laughs> in public buildings. Um, there needs to be a, a body and a process to uh, create the art that goes with that program. And uh, there's a need for a body that can review public art whenever it's put into the city. Um, and it, it has to be people who have the aesthetic sensibility uh, and judgment to deal with that. So that's really what we're trying to do. Thank you, Councillor Tabor. All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No opposed. Uh, next up is the first reading of ordinance amending Chapter 1. Uh, Article 17, Funding of Public Art, Section 1.1704, Exemption in Section 1.1707, Funding Accepted, uh, and then we will await a sample motion, move to pass first reading, and schedule public hearing and second reading at the November 14th, 2022 City Council meeting. So moved. Second. Any discussion on this? Seeing, oh, Councilor Cook. Um, thank you, Mayor, again. Um, again, this is that second ordinance, and this is our existing ordinance with regard to public art. Um, so there are some minor changes here to this ordinance. Um, one of the changes that you'll see tonight, um, I'm gonna have to roll back, it was an error, I think, in the red line in section 1.1704, where we struck, section 1.1702 and changed it to 1.1701 that should not be there it should have remained the same just to note otherwise all the red line will be the same and i will make that amendment at second reading so great all in favor aye, aye. any opposed no opposed on to third and final readings um uh, this is the third and final reading of ordinance amending chapter 10, article 5A, section 10.5A21B, amend map for building height standards, incentive overlay district, sections 10.5A21.20, building height standards, section 10.5A21.21 and 10.5A21.22, uh, section 10.5A43.32, building and story heights, Section 10.1530, uh, Terms of General Applicability. Uh, I would wait a sample motion, move to pass third and final reading, and adopt the ordinances as, as presented. So moved. Second. Any discussion on this? Uh, Councilor Moreau. Um, just to speak to some of the comments made earlier, we did remove all civic districts, so if there is a mistake on the map, we certainly will make sure that's fixed because what we're approving verbiage-wise is that none of the civic districts are part of um, the height changes. So uh, a clarifying question and maybe a legal inquiry. If a, a building is marked on the map uh, for illustrative purposes as being changed, but through the language is not being changed, uh, which supersedes and should be uh, uh, looked to uh, in, the, in a case such as that? Um, I would say that it would be the language that would be controlling. And if there's a way to, you know, bring them into alignment, that would be the best practice. But the language of the ordinance is going to be controlling over a map. Okay. And then you would, um, I, I guess, uh, do we need to, uh, would we need to amend this uh, for the map purposes uh, or? 
If I can clarify, Your Honor. Um, there was a wrong map. It was replaced at second reading. The correct map is in the packet, okay. and that does exempt civic districts. Thank you. Any discussion? Uh, Councilor Bagley. Thank you, Your Honor. Just to belabor the point so there's absolutely no confusion on this, as I understand it, uh, civic districts would include places such as the Moffat Lad House, and correct. they are excluded from <coughs> these requirements. That is correct. Okay. Oh. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? None opposed. Passes third and final reading. Uh, next up, uh, the last one on uh, reading of ordinances, third and final reading of ordinance amending chapter one, article four, section 1.414, commissions and authorities, a way to sample motion to pass, a move to pass third and final reading and adopt the ordinance as presented. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Councilor Bagley. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, I will, since, uh, I guess one of the things that I want to speak about to address some of the, the comments made tonight is when we uh, come up with something as a public body, uh, we have to do it in public so that the public has a right to know and, and see how we deliberate and how we come to our decisions. Uh, I think that was clearly apparent um, several times this year when I made overly long motions that we then had to uh, kind of decipher in real time. And, and that's what's happened here. Uh, the governance committee brought forward an idea uh, of how we could do things. Uh, we looked at the idea and we made some changes. And, and I want to speak once again to the, uh, the chair position. The reason um, that I made the uh, proposal that I made at the time was, one, I wanted to keep the, the three highly qualified individuals on the committee and uh, have the city benefit from their services. But two, um, you know, Chairman White uh, often refers to the GFOA uh, Blue Book, which, uh, you know, I've, I'm not overly familiar with, but I've made myself familiar with it. And the third or fourth bullet point is all members of the audit committee should be members of the governing body. To ensure the con committee's independence and effectiveness, no governing body members who exercise managerial responsibilities that fall within the scope of the audit should serve as a member of the audit committee. And if this blue book is, is truly the guideline, what we should have is an audit committee that is composed entirely of elected uh, officials. That's my interpretation. So not wanting to have a committee that was composed entirely of elected officials, as this suggests, I thought a good compromise would be to have an elected official be the chair and to have an equal number of appointed and elected officials on the audit committee. So I, that's how I personally got to uh, where we are tonight, um, and I will be uh, speaking in support of the uh, changes. Thank you, Councilor Bagley, any other comments? No, um, I will just say, I, to support this, there's been a lot of talk of audit committee being independent, um, and it must be independent from uh, the, the city staff and, and uh, the government. It's not to be independent of us. You are elected officials. We are accountable to you. I know that at times seems that you can, you can look at uh, politicians as something other than you, but we're not. We are the government collectively together. You're elected representatives and you, the citizens that have a uh, right to, to speak with us, to disagree with us, uh, to vote us all out of office. And so the changes that were made to the audit committee to ensure that the elected officials, your voice on the council, uh, had as much representation as those that we cherish their expertise uh, that are willing to volunteer uh, for uh, service uh, with regard to the audit committee. So I will be supporting this. I thank everyone for their uh, commitment to the discourse, and I think we've improved this uh, immeasurably. So with that, oh. Councilor Tabor always coming in after I ask everybody if they got anything no. to say. Yeah, you know, the, the residents elect us and they give us the job of oversight of the city. And a major part of that job that you elected us to do is to make sure that 
the audit is done uh, every year. And that's a council job. So Councilor Bagley is correct that the best practice according to the government, government Finance Officers Association is that it be purely elected representatives. But we value the expertise of those in the community and this compromise balances those two interests. Thank you, Councillor Tabor. Any other comments? With that, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Opposed. All right. Passes eight to one. Uh, next up, um, and I'm sorry, the fire chief was uh, here, and I should have called them up earlier, uh, but we have the city manager's uh, items which require action. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, item number one is your, the request for approval of an employment contract with the newly appointed assistant fire chief Jason Janay. The uh, memorandum explaining the contract is in your packet along with the draft agreement and both uh, Fire Chief McQuillan and Assistant Fire Chief Janay are here as well as uh, Fire Commissioner Dickey Gamester. Your Honor. I motion to approve the employment contract with Assistant Fire Chief Janay. I second. Any discussion? We're really excited uh, about this, and uh, thank you, uh, Fire Chief uh, McClellan and uh, Commissioner Gamester, for being here. Uh, Fire Department is an uh, amazing asset, um, but it's so good because of the people that, uh, that make up its ranks. So uh, thank you so much for your willingness to serve, and we'll be, I'll be excited to approve this contract. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? None opposed. Congratulations. you'd like to stay and cover for the police chief bill <laughs> <laughs> the next up is the approval of an employment contract with deputy chief of police michael maloney uh, the uh, the memorandum explaining the contract along with the proposed employment agreement is in your packet i'd wait a sample motion to uh, approve the proposed agreement as presented so moved second uh, any discussion well, I will say even because he's not here, um, I'll, we still say uh, great things uh, about uh, about Mike. Um, what a, uh, an amazing uh, person. Really happy to be able to keep him um, in uh, the employment of the city um, and really excited again uh, for another great department to have uh, great people willing to serve. So all in favor of the uh, amendment as presented? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Congratulations. Thank you, Mayor. Next up are the first of three requests for approval of collective bargaining agreements. The first request is for the what we call SMA, Portsmouth Supervisory and Management Alliance. The memorandum explaining the agreement along with the agreement itself are in your packet. Uh, and that has received um, tentative agreement approval from the union. Looking for approval of the agreement as presented. We had a motion to move and approve the proposed uh, agreement. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Uh, Councilor Lombardi. I would, I would say that um, I believe the management of this city deserves the applause too. Well, we will uh, certainly give it if the vote passes. Okay. But, uh, thank you for that. Um, anybody, any other comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? None. All right. Thanks, guys. All right. Well, now we're going to yeah, – we, we, we pushed it with applause and Mike there because he wasn't here. We've got a lot of contracts to get through. Uh, I'd ask that we keep the applause uh, till, they're, uh, till they're in front of us. But next up. Uh, item number four is approval of collective bargaining agreement with the Association of Portsmouth School Administrators. Similar to the previous uh, request, you have in your packet the memorandum explaining the agreement along with the agreement itself, which, uh, itself, which was agreed to by the union. We had a sample motion to move and approve the proposed agreement as presented. So moved. So moved. moved. Second. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. The last uh, approval of, of collective bargaining agreements this evening is with the Portsmouth Association of Clerical Employees, or PACE. Similar to the first two, 
uh, the memorandum explaining the agreement along with the agreement itself are in your packet, which has been tentatively agreed to by the union. I would wait a sample motion to approve the proposed agreement as presented. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you very much. And the, the other reason that uh, Fire Chief McQuillan yeah, is sticking, sticking around, around is <laughs> item number six. And uh, this is a request for a public hearing at the next regularly scheduled council meeting on November 14th to support the bonding authorization for the purchase of fire apparatus. What we normally do in our rolling stock is replace aging equipment. Uh, what is unique this, in this go around is um, production time for the vehicle in question is now 24 months out due to multiple factors in supply and demand. And as such, the fire chief is requesting the borrowing authorization of up to $800,000 in order to sign a contract for the new fire engine to ensure that it will be delivered on time in July of 2024 and keep the replacement schedule on track. This will avoid any price increases and borrowing of the funds would not take place until FY25, which is what we've been planning for all along. And we would not make the first payment uh, until uh, FY26 as scheduled in, uh, as projected in our current debt schedule. So all we need to do is receive authorization so that we can lock down the price and have the vehicle on time. We wait a sample motion to hold a public hearing and vote for a borrowing authorization of up to $800,000 for the purchase of a new fire apparatus on November 14th, 2022. So moved, Your Second. Honor. Second. Any discussion? Councilor Bagley and then Councilor Bowe. Yeah, thank you, Your Honor. Um, I, I think this is a great initiative by the fire department to bring it forward. Uh, recently, the mayor of Dallas uh, more or less asked the federal government to step in in speeding up the uh, manufacture of emergency vehicles because they have a, a pretty situation, a serious situation there where they don't have enough ambulances and the fire trucks. Um, the unfortunate reality is you, you can't really speed up this uh, manufacturer because it's very highly specialized. It's not like they can you know, stop making Chevy pickups and, and switch it to fire trucks. Uh, there's only a few companies that do this type of manufacturing um, and, and there's a backlog. So I, I applaud the, the fire department for bringing this forward uh, before we have an issue. Council Berry, Council Bella. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, yeah, I just want to thank um, Fire Chief McClellan and the fire department for having this foresight. Um, looking down the road, the last thing we would ever want to do is to not have a fire engine. Um, so I really appreciate him looking this far, being this prepared, um, realizing these challenges to the supply uh, chain these days, and um, yeah, taking the necessary action. Thank you, Councilor Bellock. Any other comments, questions? No, uh, look forward to taking a ride in that truck. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Up next is a request for first reading at the November 14th City Council meeting. Boy, that will be quite a meeting, huh? Um, <laughs> yeah. Is, uh, uh, continuing the theme of code cleanup as started by Planning Director Beverly Zent and, and taken up by the Land Use Committee are not so new anymore. Chief Building Inspector Shanti Wolf has been working diligently to provide updates to our building code ordinances, which were last amended just about three years ago. In July of this year, the state adopted by reference the 2018 version of the um, the various codes and the, um, as such the inspection department recommends drafting a new building code ordinance locally that uh, deletes repetitive language and combines the two existing chapters that we have which are known as chapters 12 and 15 into one revised building code ordinance so uh, we would vote uh, look for a vote to schedule first reading on, on November 14th uh, we would look for Shanti to provide a presentation at the second hearing which will be December 5th and of note, in the middle there, the city would schedule a public information session on November 21st to walk the public through the changes and provide the draft changes on our website. We wait a sample motion to schedule first reading of new city building codes, chapter 12, as rewritten for November 14th, 2022, city council meeting. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Councilor Tabor. Uh, yes, I just wanted to ask uh, staff is this a cleanup or are we looking at additional uh, code implementation beyond the state code? In other words, we have the ability right now to add local regulation and we do have quite a bit of it beyond the state code. Uh, do we foresee more of that coming in this rewrite or is it simply uh, 
cleaning up and making the code we have easier to use. Um, I'll, I'll punt while Shanti joins us, but the long and short of it is there'll be a lot of cleanup language along with a, a, a key conversation addressing the electrical portion of the code, but Shanti, please keep going. Good evening, I'm Mr. Mayor, members of the council, city manager, city attorney Morrell. To answer your question, Councilor Tabor, um, for the most part, we are cleaning up and condensing from two chapters into one, going from 55 pages to roughly 22 pages. So we're getting rid of a lot of redundancy, uh, articles that we've had that have been adopted initially and then revised, revised again, referencing articles of the state building code that are no longer on the same page or on the, even numerically the same anymore. So at this point, it really is a, a serious cleanup we will not be introducing any additional regulations. We'll be offering some clarifications, a few definitions, and uh, a couple of um, examples and allowances for situations that we've seen or that I've seen over the last nine months that I've been here that haven't really been addressed to allow for residents to accomplish some of the projects that they set out to do. So all in all, with the exception of the electrical, which uh, will be a bit more restrictive than the state code, although mostly carry forwards, um, articles that we already have in place. Uh, and when I say more restrictive, really I mean, you know, offering the, uh, a safer scenario for the residents and for businesses around the city, which you'll see during the, you know, the sample uh, draft that, that I put forward in the next few weeks. But um, not additional with the exception of, of the electrical. Thank you. Any other questions for Shanti? Uh, I was lucky enough to have a conversation with Shanti around the, uh, I don't plan to put one of these in, but a, uh, an outdoor shower. Uh, said one of the examples is, the, uh, is defining an outdoor rinse station, because he saw rinse stations at Hampton Beach, and if they're allowed at Hampton Beach, why aren't they allowed uh, in, somebody's, uh, in, in somebody's backyard if they want to do that? So. You know, it's trying to get to yes, and I appreciate everything that Shanti has done and this department has done to try to get uh, more folks trying to get people to yes when it comes to what you want to do uh, on your property and look forward to the conversation and reviewing some of those changes, uh, especially look forward to cutting the code book uh, in half uh, if we can, you know, to 22 pages. So thanks so much, Shanti, for the work Thank you, that you're doing. Have a good night. Two. Thank you. Thanks, Shanti. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, Mayor. Item number eight, similarly, as a request for first reading at the November 14th City Council meeting for amendments to Chapter 5, the Fire Code. And joining us tonight is Deputy Fire Chief Pat Howe. The City's Fire Code ordinance last was amended in December of 19. Similarly, and in July of 22 of this year, the state adopted the State Fire Code, which adopts by reference um, several other codes. And when the state fire codes updated, the fire department typically reviews and makes housekeeping amendments. Uh, the city does not adopt any amendments to the fire code. However, it will also adopt the international fire code. And so um, that's what uh, Pat Howe is seeking to do. And so similarly to what the inspections group is doing, they're going to hold a joint public information session on all of these code sections together on that date on November 21st. So uh, first reading for both November 14th public information session, November 21st, then both would come back for presentations at the December 5th council meeting. Thank you, I'd wait a sample motion to schedule first reading of amendments to chapter five for the November 14th, 2022 city council meeting. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, whether it be tonight at first reading or at second reading, I was hoping we'd be able to get more information on what impact the elimination of the solar array provisions will have uh, if we do indeed vote to approve the <coughs> ordinance. Given that the Deputy Fire Chief is here, I think it would be best coming from him. So thanks, Pat, for joining. Uh, good evening, Mayor, uh, City Manager and Council. Uh, to answer your question, we are removing our local amendment on solar. Um, really, we're not adding any requirements for anything. We've removed some that are now included uh, with the updated uh, version of the IFC as well as the state fire code. Um, as far as solar goes, 
we have uh, the state adopted an amendment which made it more solar friendly and we are actually giving uh, solar companies a choice whether they want to follow ours or the state's. Thank you, Deputy. Sure. Thank you. Any other questions, Deputy? No? Any other comments, questions? No? Nope. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Last under my name, Mayor, is a request for a first reading. Who knew on November 14th? <laughs> oh, wow. uh, for uh, <laughs> amendments to Chapter 1, Article 4, Section 1.408, currently titled Cable, Television, and Communications Commission. Last, uh, initially uh, brought to light in 1996 and most recently amended in 2005. So as you all know, there's been several advances in that industry. And the commission met recently and pr is looking to propose changes to the title and powers to broaden their responsibility beyond cable television to include such things as broadband internet services via physical transport method, including both physical cabling and over-air delivery, including cellular. So uh, these changes were um, run by the Governance Committee, and the Governance Committee supports the Commission's desire to broaden their powers in this fashion. Uh, Deputy City Manager, City Attorney Suzanne Woodland is here if you have any questions, but the, the idea would be to um, schedule first reading November 14th. Thank you. I wait a motion to schedule first reading on these proposed changes to Chapter 1, Article 4, Section 1.408 at the City Council meeting of November 14th. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Councillor Bagley. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, uh, one request I may have of this committee, if it's appropriate, and I don't know the answer to this, is uh, cell phone service in, in the city. Uh, a couple of years ago, we had a real challenge downtown at my house with some network providers it's one bar with some network providers it's no bars um, I've heard from other residents that you know they wish they had cell phone service at their house uh, understanding that it's up to uh, Verizon or, or Sprint or AT&T I guess Sprint's now T-Mobile you know to the service that they provide the component that maybe we can have an effect on is making sure that our uh, city government is friendly to them providing this service and that they don't have any uh, regulatory uh, obstacles or if they do have regulatory obstacles there's somebody that they can go to to address them so would this uh, committee be the appropriate place for that uh, type of interaction or discussion to take place well we got the expert in the room uh, <laughs> assistant uh, or uh, Deputy, Deputy <laughs> City Attorney and uh, City Manager, Suzanne. Woodward. So that's an excellent point, and it's one of the points that the Cable Commission now broadened, if uh, this uh, council approves. It's one of the questions they wanted to ask some of the cellular providers. Is there something that we could do as a municipality to help uh, encourage more investment in the infrastructure? So they want to be part of that and help that conversation along. Um, so they want to be both uh, uh, help uh, be the voice to add a little more voice it's not just uh, you know individual residents or businesses or, or even just a, a government em employee so to speak but help to maybe elevate the conversation and look for opportunities so great thank you thank you Councilor Bagley any other questions comments um, I would just ask that when we are we got a lot of things that are coming forth on the uh, the 14th uh, those are all first readings but if it's possible uh, when we think about scheduling these out uh, to schedule them on two consecutive uh, council meetings so we don't have when they come to second reading uh, don't have a pile uh, like eight uh, public hearings uh, on these um, we want to make sure that they all have uh, adequate time for the public to weigh in and also want to make sure that we get home before one o'clock in the morning so um, all right uh, with that uh, all in favor aye. Aye. aye any opposed none opposed all right so next up we do have the consent agenda now if you would like to uh, uh, pull anything out um, uh, we should do that now assistant mayor thank you your honor I'd make a motion to pull um, letter C out of the um, consent agenda to be voted on separately Great. Um, and now uh, I would, uh, is there a second? Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, <laughs> now I wait a motion to approve motion. the uh, consent agenda. So moved. Second. 
All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, the assistant mayor. Um, you and I um, make, I will not vote on, on uh, letter C as I um, am the uh, founder of this festival that we are looking to move to downtown. Uh, we are in the process myself, Evan Mallett, Dave Vargas, and Marie Collins, who's a PhD student at UNH, are in the process of starting um, a 5013C for the All right. Um, so we would, uh, I would await a motion uh, then to uh, move to refer to the city manager with the authority to act. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in. All right, well, I'm excited. Uh, uh, Councilor Tabor seems to be excited about it too. Um, but I, Hold know, me back. The, uh, it's, uh, it's something that uh, uh, has been really successful um, at uh, where it's currently located, and I think it would be a great celebration, especially with the 400th, to have it right in, in uh, the downtown. Uh, so very much looking forward uh, to this. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed or abstained? Abstain. Thank you. All right. Next up, uh, email correspondence. Uh, I'd wait a, a motion to accept and place on file. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Um, and then we have a, a letter from uh, Phil Miller uh, regarding a children's theater at the community campus. Um, I would. Uh, know if we have the committee uh, for this yet uh, with this uh, is there any is, is there any motion uh, other than to place this on file I'd move we place it on file your honor a second okay. uh, all in favor Aye. 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 all right so um, we're on to uh, uh, council agenda uh, I'm up first uh, with the uh, CIP uh, subcommittee uh, announcement um, this was uh, really designed to, to be a, a working group uh, I've asked uh, Councillor Tabor uh, Councillor Moreau and Councillor Blaylock uh, to serve uh, on this uh, and it's a way um, to get more uh, input uh, we have more uh, CIP requests than we've ever or at least I've ever had going back three years so uh, What's that? That will be the, the, the history that I use this. But I want to make sure that there's more opportunities uh, to communicate. I've asked that we would meet um, at the first, uh, November 3rd, Thursday at, at 6 p.m., uh, so not during the day, uh, but uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the evening. And then, really, it's just, uh, it's not a, you know, we still have the process that's governed by, um, you know, our rules as a council, um, the charter. Uh, but I want to make another opportunity, especially as we, we reached out for more input than, than ever before uh, in, in different ways. Uh, we got a lot of input. Some of that input wasn't in the normal way that you typically put a CIP request. And so I think there is a learning opportunity to talk about that, to talk about why you know, some requests would be, uh, would be taken up and other requests um, would be uh, sought through different means or are already being covered. So. Really, it's a desire for uh, this council to make sure that we have more opportunity to connect at a time when, when most, not all, especially you know people with young children, might not be able to make it. Uh, it's right around dinner time, uh, but an effort to, to have an additional part of the process. There's not going to be. Uh, this is there's no other appointees. It's uh, simply councilors uh, creating another opportunity to have a, a working session. Uh, on this to involve uh, the public and go through some of the uh, the requests that we got. So happy to answer any questions, and I do thank the councilors for agreeing uh, to serve on this. Councilor Morrell? I'll just make the comment that it, it does is a confusing process for a lot of the public, so I think this is a great opportunity because I believe we're doing this in a discussion format. That's why there's only three of us counselors that are attending it. And this way we can actually have a back and forth with some of the people that put in these requests so they can understand why they might not make the CIP, whether they're already in some other thing or they're more appropriate in another line item. So it would be a nice chance to actually have open dialogue versus just the um, 
way we normally do it. So that was the other good reason yeah. for doing well, it. Yeah. And people sometimes wonder, well, you're so stiff up there. Yeah. Why can't you talk? <laughs> well, there's rules, uh, you know, about that. And so creating this, you know, it was uh, uh, similar to what we tried to do with the budget work sessions to create uh, a dialogue and we'll see if it works uh, and hopefully it does and there's feedback uh, to that. Any other comments? Thank you again uh, for serving. No action needed at the moment, uh, but appreciate uh, the willingness to serve. Um, next up, uh, Portsmouth 400th Committee. Um, I just, I, I wanted this um, for, uh, we, we've had some presentations on, uh, on uh, specific uh, parts of this, but I think that there's a lot of people that ask me and I'm sure ask everyone um, about the uh, about the 400th. Uh, you know, when is the parade? I'm like, well, uh, you know, it's there's a, you know, when is it? When is the day that you're celebrating? Well, there's a couple of days. So I just want uh, to have a, a report back um, uh, from the Portsmouth 400th Committee. You know, hopefully under Council Moreau's uh, name uh, that goes into this uh, in more detail and to get at everybody's attention, especially since we're, you know, the. November 24th meeting is, uh, you know, it's 14th, the next meeting, 14th, 14th meeting. It's the, we're not meeting during Thanksgiving. I'm pretty sure November 24th <laughs> is actually Thanksgiving. Yeah, so. so we're not, we'll be uh, <laughs> not meeting on that. Um, but um, appreciate uh, that and I'd wait a sample motion or uh, a motion to request a report back from the Portsmouth 400th committee. So moved. Second. Uh, any more discussion on that? Councilor Murrow? Um, just quickly so that before we actually have a chance to report back, there is, um, and City Manager Kennard can correct me, it's Portsmouth, uh, pnh400.org yeah. is the actual website and there is an online calendar that is currently being generated and populated, although it's, it's a process to get it together, but there will be events pretty much throughout the year, starting New Year's Eve and ending New Year's Eve. So. Um, it will be a full year of events. I would say the bulk of the events will technically be sort of May to October, but it's not just one time. So yep. I'll reiterate it's Portsmouth and H400.org <coughs> and uh, you can sign up for regular, if not weekly news uh, email updates. And to date, there are 90, 90 approved events yes. relating to the celebration. And um, in support of the effort, Mayor, in addition to the time and energy I can put into it, I'm adding to that to that resource team my colleague, the Assistant City Manager for Economic Development, Sean Clancy. So um, there'll be more eyes, eyes and ears and more resources put toward this effort. Uh, thank you, City Manager, and uh, thank you, Sean, uh, for that. Uh, I think it's an awesome opportunity, and look forward to that. So, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. Um, I would. It's a heavy heart that I accept the resignation uh, of Arthur Parrott uh, from the Zoning Board of Adjustment. Uh, Arthur has served the city uh, for nearly uh, 40 years. I think it was. I think it was 39 uh, years. Uh, and um, it's. Uh, that's how uh, this whole thing works. Um, it's by citizens. Uh, taking responsibility uh, in the future of our city uh, and wanting to put uh, the time and effort into it. Unfortunately, Arthur needs to be at home more now uh, and it's, um, it's only because of that that he will not be uh, serving. Uh, but I just uh, thank him uh, for, on behalf of uh, the City Council and the City of Portsmouth for the effort uh, that he put into making uh, Portsmouth, the city that we know um, and love today. Thank you, Arthur, uh, for all of the work. Um, and uh, if you're here right now, I'd be giving you a challenge coin, but uh, you're not, so I'll bring it by your house. Uh, Councilor Moreau? Yeah, I, I'd just like to add, it, it reiterate everything you said. I, you know, as a title attorney, I still to this day come across plans of Portsmouth that Arthur Parrott signed when he was chairman of the planning board. Yeah. So his service is extended over multiple boards and as a previous volunteer on the planning board, I, I understand the dedication and the commitment that it takes for the years that he's served. So I'd just like to express my personal heartfelt thank you. I've gotten a chance to get to know him over the years and it, it's a great loss for the city. Anyone else? Thank you, Arthur.
Um, and in the vein of, of serving, uh, as Arthur has, um, we have some appointments to be considered uh, and then some appointments to be voted. Uh, first, uh, appointments to be considered, no action will be taken tonight. Uh, appointment of uh, Stuart Shepard to the Conservation uh, Commission. Appointment of Brian Gibb as an alternate to the Conservation Commission. Appointment of Assistant Mayor Kelly uh, to the DOT Public Advisory Committee for the Route 1 Bypass. Appointment of Mary Lou McElwain to the DOT Public Advisory Committee for the Route 1 Bypass. Appointment of Ann uh, Wideman as a regular member of the Economic Development Commission. Uh, appointment of Charlie, uh, Charles Doliak to the Task Force to Study Private Public Historical Archive. Uh, I'm going to lump these. Uh, appointment of Kristen Peterson, uh, Emma Stratton, Thomas Watson, and uh, uh, Lawrence Yurden uh, all to the Task Force to Study Public Private Historical Archive. Uh, thank you for uh, considering uh, serving. And with any uh, counselor, as always, uh, please reach out to me. Uh, with any questions that you have uh, on these appointments. Next up, um, the appointments to be uh, voted. We have the reappointment of Everett Eaton to the Economic uh, Development Commission, uh, reappointment of Tom Watson to the Economic Development Commission, appointment of uh, Richard Candy to the Task Force to Study Public-Private Historical Archives, appointment of Susan Sterry to the Task Force to Study Public-Private Historical Archives, Appointment of Thomas uh, Hardiman, Jr. to the Task Force to Study Public-Private Historical Archives. Appointment of Katinka de Routier uh, to the Board of Library Trustees. Uh, reappointment of uh, Janika Fonseca to the Board of Library Trustees. And that is it. So I'd wait a, a motion to approve those appointments. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Councilor Bagley. Uh, thank you. I just. In the in the packet, we get to see the resumes of, of all the people that volunteer in Portsmouth, and, and it's true tonight, and it's true, you know, every night that we vote on these appointments. But uh, you know, it, it's staggering to see the accomplishments of many of our residents. Um, certainly, I don't want to uh, point out anybody in particular, but uh, it certainly uh, made me glad that my resume was not going head to head with some of these individuals. <laughs> <laughs> it's. Um it's certainly um, it's quite amazing um, considering uh, the time uh, that goes into this often uh, um, thankless uh, in terms of the, the work when you when you get on any commission and I'll, I guess I'll speak a little bit longer because I have so many tonight um, when you get on a commission you realize there's so much more to a problem than you think uh, that's certainly been my experience with being on the council. You realize that there's a lot of opposing sides and trying to, uh, to, to weigh that, um, know that there's not an easy answer. And if the easy answer is the one you choose, uh, it's, it's usually not the, the, the best one uh, because it's, it's left off uh, something that uh, required a, a little bit more uh, nuance. And, you know, we can't pass the buck in Portsmouth. It literally stops with us. There's not like comes from the national, the state level. They can talk about all these things, but we actually have to do it here. And the fact that we have so many people willing to implement the rules that we come up with, um, it's a testament to the, the care and love that they bring to the city. So uh, thank you, uh, everyone that has stepped up to serve. And thank you, uh, those that have gone through it and are seeking reappointment. It means an awful lot uh, to the city. We could not function without you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No opposed. Thank you. All right. Next up, Councilor Tabor. Thank you, Mayor. Um, last I updated you on community power was February, and we've been very busy. Uh, right now, we're drafting an energy aggregation plan, which we'll submit to the U Public Utilities Commission. And that's essentially our business plan for Portsmouth Community Power. We got a lot of help from the Community Power Coalition of New Hampshire drafting that. And we'll give you a draft, we hope, uh, in December. And then we'll have two public hearings on that as required by statute in January, followed by a council vote and submission to the state regulators. Um, the uh, Coalition for Community Power, which will be our nonprofit that has uh, 21 member towns and cities right now, is really 
becoming a reality. Um, they have $750,000 of seed money. They've hired Ascend Analytics to be their electricity buyer, a very sophisticated buyer to create a portfolio of contracts. And um, they're hoping to have a CEO and staff in place by early next year uh, and be ready for the first wave of towns to have community power in May. And Kevin Charette of our Energy Committee is doing a terrific job as our board member on CPCNH. And uh, given his utility background, he's been drafted into a lot of their committees and uh, is doing a great service for us. Um, one other thing that's coming up, uh, the, uh, we'll have the option to buy a lot of green power through the coalition. And our buying power in that co-op will give us the best prices for green energy. But we want to find out how much demand there is. When we had an event in June, we were surprised that 75% of the people we surveyed in a spot survey, an electronic survey that night, wanted to buy more green power. So we want to take that survey citywide and develop a menu of options um, so that you can buy uh, 50% renewable or 100% renewable if you want. We want to see what that demand is. And that we're hoping to mail out in December. And then um, we're teaming up with the Rye Energy Committee to have an event November 3rd at the Portsmouth Library called Button Up, How to Reduce Your Energy Consumption This Winter. So uh, as utility rates spike, uh, this might be a chance to figure out some smart ways to uh, control costs and make your house more efficient. And lastly, uh, we're working on a logo for Portsmouth Community Power. So if any of uh, people with artistic inclinations out there would like to help us develop a logo, maybe some tugboats with some lightning bolts or the North Church with some lightning I think bolts. you're volunteering. <laughs> You've got some ideas. So, <laughs> we're, we're looking for that to give us a, a logo and a presence. So if uh, you're interested in have ideas for that, contact me or the city manager's office. Thank you, Councillor Tabor. Yeah. Exciting stuff. Any questions for Councillor Tabor? I'll just say that it is, uh, it's, it's a lot of work uh, that's going into this, and it's uh, exciting, and um, you know, the flexibility this will provide, um, as well as the, the green energy component, but in addition, the flexibility to be able to chart our own course uh, with this uh, without being beholden to uh, what the state has or has not done uh, when it comes to both diversification of energy supplies to protect us when things like natural gas uh, go through the roof. Um, yeah. It's a it's a big thing, uh, and look forward to kicking this off or or seeing what we're we're going to come back with. So, <coughs> thank you, Councilor Tabor. Councilor Moreau, uh, you have a uh, I, well. This one you got competing. We got I, doing well. <laughs> doing banjos with Councilor Moreau and Actually. Councilor Bagley here. So, have you guys figured it out? Uh, I was going to, if uh, the council would so let me, I would like to make a motion to suspend the rules uh, to allow Councilor uh, Bagley to speak before me, so that it sort of works more in flow and flow in tandem. Second. All in uh, favor? Can I make a? I, we have to. Um, we have to suspend the rules. First. We have to suspend the rules oh. to, to for you to do anything. <laughs> uh, so all in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, any opposed? No. Okay. <laughs> It may make the most sense to pull forward item one. Okay. And then leave item two, two to after your okay. item, just what so there's not a totally different makes, subject in between yeah. the two. Okay, no, so that's fine. Uh, we're gonna have to do this again. We will, uh, uh, we're gonna, no, I'd wait a motion for, uh, to suspend the rules to uh, bring forth uh, uh, section item uh, one under section C. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Councilor Bagley, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, in the packet tonight, we have the Parking Traffic Safety Committee Action Sheet and Minutes of October 6, 2022. Uh, I move to accept and approve the Action Sheet and Minutes of the October 6, 2022 Parking and Traffic Safety Committee meeting. Second. And to clarify, to accept these minutes would be to end the uh, the because it's a vote that was taken as part of the minutes, it would be to end the, uh, the Islington Creek uh, parking program. 
I think Councillor Bagley can correct me if I'm yeah. wrong, but it was to recommend to us to decide when to end it, but that they recommend for it to end at some point. So, Is that, okay. I guess there's a technical question for city staff is it's currently scheduled to end on December, December 4th? 4th correct yeah. so if we pass this tonight I guess it would be up to staff to end it on December 4th or immediately or if, if I may I believe the intent of parking and traffic safety was to give that notice as soon as it arrived at that decision so that the council could have time between that decision and December 4th to make any adjustments to what is the pilot so just because the committee took a vote to end the pilot did not mean it ended it prematurely or in advance of when it is supposed to sunset, which is December 4th. I hope that helps. Okay. It might not have helped me, but I'll try to. <laughs> it's still so, in place. <laughs> so um, typically, learn this on the last council and you learn things, then you forget them. But uh, if the recommendation is, um, what was the, exact wording the recommendation was to end it in December 4th just to end it or just to end it because it's not so the recommendations are uh, in the action sheet um, or the minutes if we accept the recommendations they they occur immediately and that and the reason for that as I understand is that if they make a recommendation to like put a stop sign in somewhere uh, we can do that before um, a uh, the ordinance uh, is amended or like a speed uh, a speed change that we could do that before officially accepting the speed limit so we're changing the speed limit per ordinance so are we looking to end this um, by the vote of the uh, of the uh, PTS Councilor Bagley uh, I'll speak to that your honor because this did come up in the PTS uh, discussion if I recall correctly and we kind of wanted to give the council the flexibility to decide when the end date would be so as a second part of approving these minutes there is going to be an action item move to end the pilot program and to present the framework of the parking director as recommended by the parking and traffic safety committee and I guess my question to the city attorney is um, if I made that motion move to the end of the pilot program as scheduled would that kind of take care of this issue and make the intent clear I think that that would help um, <clears throat> the parliamentary rule is that if you're accepting the minutes of a committee it's the same as accepting their recommendation of the committee so if you want to clarify the recommendation uh, so would I uh, amend my current motion or withdraw my current motion and remake it that stipulation so the motion to amend it would you need a motion to amend? so here so right now we're voting on the motion to move to accept and approve the action sheet of the minutes of the October 6th parking PTS committee meeting um, which will uh, in effect end the pilot program um, and without a date given it would seem like it would end immediately but that could be open to interpretation um, but that is uh, so that's the first thing that we're, op uh, we're discussing and then we have the action items um, none of which we need uh, if you have this was all kind of brought up because the last the last council we never voted on the or we never got consensus on accepting the minutes of the parking and traffic safety so we split out the action items both for clarity and also if people wanted to approve a action item and they did not want to approve minutes of which they did not uh, were not present for uh, because we had a, uh, a, a that's how we extended the the, the, the Middle Street bike lane um, and so that's what this clarification uh, came in but we will not I would be afraid that uh, by approving the minutes we would end up being uh, we would uh, we would end the pilot program um, but that seems like you want to do in the pilot program uh, uh, parking program discussion and recommendation of the program uh, uh, down at the bottom there mayor if I could because I'm also a voting member on parking and traffic safety I'm fairly certain the intent of the committee was to give the council some time before the official sunset date of December 4th to determine what they wanted and I'll read the language in the action item which is slightly different than what's in the agenda it says voted to recommend that council end the pilot program and to present the framework laid out by the parking director if a permanent program is implemented by the council I think that's important language and I, I do I'll reiterate I think the intent of PTS was to allow the pilot to play out 
in the event the council needed time to make a final determination. So I, I don't know if that does um, support your desire to change your motion. I guess, uh, Your Honor, if, if I might, um, I'll rescind my previous motion and I will make a new motion, which is move to accept and approve the action sheets and minutes of the October 6, 2022 Parking Traffic Safety Committee meeting with the pilot program scheduled to end on December 4th. Second. So, well, I don't know if we, how can we, I mean, they're the, the, the minutes, we can't change the minutes um, in this. So I don't, I guess I'm confused of why we are, I'm, I'm confused of why PTS chose to vote to end the pilot program uh, or recommend the, the, the program ending if it was going to end. I guess that'd be one. Um, since it doesn't need to be voted on, since it was uh, going to end, um, the so I guess I'm I'm slightly confused about the the reasoning for the PTS taking the vote. Councilor Cook, um, thank you, Mayor. Um, I I'm thinking we could approve. We could do this in two motions potentially, by approving the action sheet and then in a separate motion setting an end date or the MPP, because if the initial motion or the parking traffic and safety doesn't set an end date officially, then as a council, we would need to do that, I would think, separately. And instead of having it in the same, commingled in the same motion to accept the minutes, is that accurate? The opportunity to set an end date. Um, I was trying to clarify what you meant, what yep. the committee meant. Right. Your Honor. Yep. I, if I could speak to it, I think I might be able to address some of your concerns well, I don't have concerns but I, I, well I guess the what I'm trying to figure out is what we're trying to vote on and the, what we're what we're presented with is the recommendation to end the pilot program by the parking and traffic safety there's not a specified date but that was already going to end um, and so I'm I'm curious on what we're uh, what we're voting on um, it, it was if it was voted on to not continue after December 4th that would be different, but it's been voted to end on December, or just vote to end. So I don't know if what we're trying to achieve can be achieved with the minutes that we have. So I would, it would be my uh, recommendation to not uh, vote on these minutes uh, or vote them down um, because there's, we're not going to achieve, uh, you know, what was to be desired by the PTS, which was not to continue uh, the parking program and not to end the parking program. Does that does that make sense, uh, Councillor Bagley? Yeah, Your Honor, it does make sense. And, and to shed some light on how PTS got here, uh, as you may recall, this program has been extended uh, numerous times. So we addressed the question as uh, not so much should we end it, but whether or not we should continue the program. And the consensus. Um, was that it's it's gone on long enough and it's time to end the pilot program. I don't think, and, and this is uh, my responsibility as chair, is we didn't clarify do we end it you know, immediately or do we end it over the next six weeks, so to speak. I, I don't think we um, felt that was a decision for PTS. We felt that was a decision for the council. However, I would say uh, the temperature in the room was that one, uh, we definitely thought it was time to end the program, not extend it any further and I don't think the committee particularly would like to see this uh, issue return to them without some serious guidance from council because we've strayed from uh, let's say uh, issues into policy area so the committee didn't want to overstep its authority and be making policy decisions or recommendations we really felt the council um, probably has enough data from the pilot program and that it should take that data and make a policy decision whether or not they want to have a, a parking program or not have a parking program. I got it. I think I got a, I, I don't mean to catch, I think I got a, 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 a way forward for this. So what I would, you know, check parliamentary inquiry, can we vote to table the, the minutes of the uh, action sheet and minutes or yeah, the, the action sheet and minutes of the October 6, 2022 uh, uh, meeting? Uh, and then take up the action items needing council approval separately? 
Yes. Okay. So I would. So you should table it to a certain date. Yep. Yeah, let's let's table or I would await a motion to table uh, parking and traffic safety committee action sheet and minutes of October 6, 2022, until uh, the number of ever 14th uh, city council meeting. So moved. Second. Uh, and does everybody follow what? I'm trying to do here. I'm trying to get the minutes out so we can deal specifically with the action items, which include the pilot, which we could amend without amending the minutes of that. Okay. So uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Great. Okay. So you have it. We now go through the taxi stands, Morning Street, and then to the old uh, meat and potatoes there at the end. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I move to eliminate all taxi stands except for in front of the Tuscan Steakhouse. Second. Uh, and just to speak to this very quickly, we currently have six taxi, taxi stands in the city, uh, three of them which are exclusively taxi stands and three of them which are shared space with loading zones. Um, at one time, the city had, I believe, up to 28 taxi medallions, which you would require to have to use a taxi stand. We currently have one taxi medallion we spoke with the uh, gentleman who owns the one taxi medallion. He said uh, he can't use more than one at a time, so he has no problem with this. Okay. And out of all the ones that uh, were available, he thought that was the one that's most helpful for him. We did uh, bring to his attention that that part of Pleasant Street is often closed in the summertime. He said that's no issue. So he's, he's happy with this um, being the one taxi stand. And after the meeting, um, I, I kind of thought about this, and I don't think we should put it for a vote tonight, but I would like to put the idea out there that we consider grandfathering the taxi uh, program. Okay. We can I think that would be a good thing to take up at the PTS <laughs> meeting, and we'll make sure to uh, uh, come back. I think, you know, one taxi, um, it seems like, we should at least uh, look at that in the process of medallions, uh, the, the taxis, and it, it might make sense to do something differently. But with the, the motion on the floor, uh, any other comments on that? Uh, I thank uh, PTS for looking at that. I thank the Assistant Mayor for uh, bringing this forward. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, on to Morning Street. Uh, I motion that Morning Street, oh, sorry. Uh, motion move to install no parking here to corner signs 30 feet from Woodbury Avenue. Second. Any discussion on this? Nope. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Um, next up, you have the neighborhood parking program. Questions? So I move to end the pilot program as originally scheduled and to present the framework of the parking director as recommended by Parking and Traffic and Safety Committee. Second. Any discussion, Councillor Tabor? Uh, well, I would just ask Councillor Bagley to clarify what, what you mean by present in your motion. Uh, present to us for deliberation or uh, you're not asking for us to direct a policy direction here so uh, I just I was unclear on what you meant by present I, I could speak to that yep. um, so we've um, we've done the neighborhood pilot parking program for about a year and a half total I think when it gets to the end date and we've had a lot of data we've also had um, quite a few public speakers uh, two for against um, indifferent um, some spoke tonight but we've we've had many many more um, come to our meetings or send an email so there's there's been a lot of discussion in the community and I would say it's fair to say there's no consensus um, it's probably not 50 50 if I had to guess it's probably 60 40 in favor however that was when the program was under uh, operating under the pilot rules which was at no charge to everyone so what the committee thought was best since this is um, you know it's not putting up a stop sign or a speed bump it's not a safety issue it's a um, a community want let's say so it's really a, a political decision do we want to have a parking program and if we want to have a parking program 
what would that look like? And we thought as a committee that uh, Director Fletcher had put some, some pretty valuable data together um, and that it might be helpful to the council if Director Fletcher was to pr present the data, which he has done in the packet. Uh, we could then uh, ask the director any questions and then um, not to steal uh, Councillor Moreau's uh, thunder, but I think she's gonna have some you know, thoughts on this um, that she's collected uh, from the community. Okay. So I think the objective tonight is to say the pilot has gone on long enough, so to speak. We have data now that we can use and it's up to the council to probably do one of three things. One, uh, to continue a program that is identical. Two, to create a framework for a program if, if this neighborhood or another neighborhood in the city wanted to have such a program. Or three, uh, to say we're not interested in neighborhood parking programs and, and place the data on file. Okay, thanks. That, that's great. So we're, we're essentially voting to end the pilot program and then hear a presentation. Or hear the data. So yeah, I mean, I guess the the the, the word end. You know, this is not just because thinking about what's going to be in the paper tomorrow. I'm more thinking like you know what the the action of this is to is to is to do, um, and that action from PTS, as I understand it, is that they no longer want to run a a pilot program. That they've collected as much data as they will collect. And so they're shifting the buck back to where it's gotta stop, and that's us in terms of making a decision. So um, I'm fine with the you know, uh, move to end the, the pilot program as, as regularly scheduled. I might have changed it to uh, you know, not renew the, the, the pilot program, uh, but that ultimately it's our call once uh, we've stated that we're no longer in the pilot phase. So we've moved on to, if we're gonna do something, we got the data, let's do something, or not do something, but it's our call now. That's how I understand the intent of, of that motion and the, the will of PTS as, as, uh, as shared by uh, um, Councillor Bagley. I, I would agree that that is a very um, accurate representation of the PTS's uh, feelings. Okay, so um, any other discussion? Again, I think we're gonna, ha we will have discussion on how we would, so this is not a vote if you, if you don't want or do want a pilot program, it's a vote to say that the pilot program, whether or not you want a neighborhood parking program or not, has to come to an end, and we are going to end that, pub uh, that, that pilot program when it was scheduled to do by December 4th, okay. Uh, all in favor, uh, or I'll do a roll call vote. Roll call, uh, Kelly, if you can. Yes, Mayor. Assistant Mayor Kelly? Yes. Councilor Tabor? Yes. Councilor Denton? Yes. Councilor Moreau? Yes. Councilor Bagley? Yes. Council Lombardi? Yes. Council Blaylock? Yes. Council Cook? Yes. Mayor McEachern? Yes. Unanimous. Okay, now we're going back to Councilor Moreau. Yes. Is, that, is that correct? Because then we'll come back to <laughs> Rule 43. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I actually attended the last Parking, Traffic, and Safety Committee because I knew this was going to be discussed. And as everyone on this council knows, I live within the NPP program. Um, I have many neighbors and have been in the neighborhood for 20 years. Um, there are, yes, a few people that are adamantly against it. I think that there are some parameters, and we've discussed this, like what to look at. We've been looking at other cities. I know as a planning board member for many years, parking is always, as we all know, top of everyone's discussion list. So I think for publicity's sake, we really need to look at a parking management program, especially for the neighborhoods that abut the downtown because we all know that the more downtown parking gets expensive or gets overrun, that it all bleeds out into the adjoining neighborhoods. And for that reason, I think we really need to look at a framework that'll work for possibly all neighborhoods as far as how you evaluate it and possibly implement it. It might be unique um, to certain ones. 
Um, so I thought, you know, we have been the pilot program, so now let's take the data that we have from the pilot program, let's take the experience that we have, and try to start to work with what a parking management program for a neighborhood would look like in our city. And, and the neighborhoods that abut downtown mostly are mixed use. There are some businesses, but a fair amount of residents, and, and a little bit of in between. So um, in looking at the data that um, Director Fletcher brought forward, we looked at that and we thought that some of the points were great. Um, I think that some of the data that we've been given could be argued. Um, so part of my wanting to have a discussion with all of you tonight was to get your feedback about some of the points that we came up with. So we talk about, you know, how many parking spaces did it open, but what we don't talk about is who were the people that were parked there before and who were the people that were parked there after it started. So you might have had, sir, you know, whatever the, you know, it opened up one to two, three spaces. Well, it might have actually opened up 10 to 15 spaces because now instead of having others park there, you know, some of the people from the neighborhood are actually able to park there. So that's actually a number we can't really figure out because it's not a way, you don't have a way to actually figure that number out. So I just think that there are some ways to look at these numbers that works and some that, you know, you could question may or may not be applicable. Also, when you're looking at their percentage of like 85%, I mean, that's a, that's a utilization they do for commercial places, so like the downtown, right? You want a certain percentage in order to make sure everything's <coughs> properly utilized. I think we have to look at different percentages if we're talking about actual neighborhood programs because I think that parking management would be a little bit different. And I'm no expert, but I certainly lived long enough in this neighborhood to know what the issues can be and what the issues are. So, um, as a group, a small group of the neighbors, we, we worked on, and I enjoy feedback, um, we worked on some parameters, we worked on some rules, and we worked on some fees. And we thought uh, residential permits um, at $10 a month seemed to be a fairly reasonable amount to ask somebody who lived in the neighborhood. And we thought of giving one free guest pass to each person that has a resident each household that has a residential permit and not to put a limit on how many permits. So if people wanted more than one, they could have more than one as long as they were a residential. We thought on the commercial properties, they could get the same um, dollar value, but up to three permits. And then beyond that, we'd go to $50 a month with no guest passes. And the reason for the 50 is that equates it exactly to what you would pay an employee to park at the foundry garage. So we figured we really needed to, after a certain amount, encourage them to actually go use the garage or pay at least the same amount if they were gonna use the neighborhood. Um, some of the parameters that we looked at um, for our specific neighborhood were basically the, the streets would be um, bounded by the north side of Islington, the west of Bridge Street, including Dover Street East, south of North Mill Pond. We were looking at um, program requirements of like 65% of dwelling units in the neighborhood to approve a program. Dwelling units consisting of single family homes, condominiums, multi-unit multi buildings of four units or less. And we were looking at utilization of a program of approximately like 70% and a program to include at least 100 properties so that you are talking about areas that are at least of a decent size. Um, I think our area has over 200 if we, uh, when it was counted out originally when I look back at the original data. Um, and let's see, we, some of the rules, we, uh, we looked at permits could not be issued or renewed for any person, so they'd have to be renewed on an annual basis. Um, or we could do a quarterly basis. We talked about that as well for renters that might not all end or start on the same time. Um, we talked about if you have any outstanding parking violations, you're not able to get a permit. Um, you would need a valid registration for the permit. You would have, that would have to be to the residential address. Um, Let's see, anything, anyone that was on an unregistered vehicle could be revoked and no refund would be issued. You know, we've looked at permit holders must provide a name, address, a contact number, and a driver's license in proof of residency. Um, some of the things that have already been done or in place could be used. Uh, permits are non-refundable and um, anything, in, you know, and in, in put in some language, <laughs> here's the attorney, any permit or any part thereof that is altered or falsified shall be revoked no refund issued. So in case of business entities with multiple permits, um, the revocation is not limited to permit in question, all issued permits subject to revocation, no refunds. So we started to put together this framework, but I didn't wanna just 
bring something together. I was hoping now to get feedback from all of you based off of what parking traffic and safety has looked at, based off of what I've brought forward. Feedback. What do you think? Any. Councilor Bagley. <laughs> Thank you. Let's jump back into it. After getting it back to the council, um, yes, you want to get back into it. Well, I, I appreciate uh, Councilor Moreau bringing all of this forward. Uh, as she mentioned, I believe she's the only councilor that lives in this neighborhood. Um, so she has a, let's call it, first hand view of it. Um, it's probably also worth noting. Uh, I hope you don't mind me saying this, but you have plenty of off street parking at I your do. particular I residence. I don't actually need the program so, anymore. <laughs> so I don't think she's um, doing this for uh, her own personal benefit, let's say. Um, what we probably have to do is, so I, I've done a ton of research on neighborhood parking programs and, and basically speaking very roughly, most of them were created in the late 70s and early 80s, uh, all throughout the country and, and, and actually worldwide. Um, and they come in a thousand different flavors, let's say. And for the most part, they've really never been amended or changed because it's uh, so much of a political hot potato that it's better to just stay with what you got than to, to make any uh, necessary adjustments. So personally, I'm probably not in favor of neighborhood parking programs. Um, however, having heard um, all the speakers and done all the research, I do see that there can be a time when they're, they make sense. However, I feel that they need to follow some right criteria. Um, one, they, they need to be self-funded. Uh, two, they need to be uh, fair and equitable. And three, um, they have to be as simple as possible. Uh, we don't wanna end up in a situation where we have 50 street signs on every block telling you when and where you can park and how you can park. We wanna you know, do this with as little impact as possible. So what I would propose potentially tonight, we could schedule a work session on uh, neighborhood parking programs using Councilor Moreau and Director Fletcher, some combination of, of those two data sets and come up with a framework, if you will. Um, Councilor Moreau used $10 a month. I believe Director Fletcher recommended $125 a year. Uh, I think we can compromise and, and just go with $10 a month. Um, and, uh, you know, let's, because, because when the parking program was free, I, I think it was easy to get people to sign up. Uh, if we're going to charge for it, which I think we need to because it has to be paid for somehow, uh, it would be very interesting to see what the community has to say. And I think the, the thorniest issue between what uh, Councilor Moreau said and, and what um, Director Fletcher laid out is where is that um, engagement point? How many people in the neighborhood percentage-wise have to agree to sign up for this? And, and this is a really tricky point because if, if we say it's 60% or 70%, um, that means 40% or 30% of the people in that neighborhood are going to have to be part of this program, even though they don't want to. So I think that's the hardest part about this is figuring out what is the, the right percentage of buy-in that we need in a neighborhood. Because I think we all know that um, logic will tell us that it has to be over 50%. And logic would also tell us that it's highly unlikely we would ever get 100%. So what is that number that, um, is fair and equitable and and would uh, allow for a program like this to move forward. And one of the most compelling arguments for having a program like this that I heard was um, affordable housing. So repeatedly we heard about the micro apartments at Stady. Uh, we had a, an opportunity for micro apartments at 93 Pleasant Street, but that was denied um, for a number of reasons, but parking being one of them, and it was switched to uh, from housing to office space, which doesn't require off-street parking. If we want to uh, encourage smaller affordable parking uh, apartments that maybe don't have the parking requirements that um, we currently have, one possible way to accomplish that is to have neighborhood parking programs, because that will kind of protect. And I don't want to call it a right because that's not what it is. The streets uh, don't belong to anybody. 
they belong to all of us in the city. Um, but it would protect uh, historical parking norms in neighborhoods that abut the downtown. So it's, it's a much more complex issue than I thought when I first looked into this. Um, I think we have a, a lot of great data that the city collected for us. And uh, I think we can have a robust discussion on a framework of what makes sense. Um, but I think the best way to do that potentially is a work session. Okay, uh, Councillor Cook. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I thank Councillor Moreau for the extensive work that she's done discussing um, this issue with her neighbors. And um, I think that it's really important to note that the data isn't always um, reflective of the reality. There are, are always factors that play into data. Um, that she so rightly pointed out. Um, I also thank Councillor Bagley for suggesting a work session. I think this is a much bigger d discussion <coughs> that the council has to have. Um, and, and the discussion has to go beyond just whether or not we have a program in this particular neighborhood. But it does have to stretch to what is the point of having a parking program? Where is the impingement? What is the problem we're trying to solve? And if the problem we're trying to solve is downtown parking infringing upon neighborhoods, then this clearly is not the only neighborhood that has that challenge. And we shouldn't necessarily be defining a program by specific neighborhoods. Point in fact, this neighborhood stretches a long distance and one end of the neighborhood doesn't have the same challenges as the other. So not all members of this neighborhood are impacted um, by parking challenges from pressures from downtown. And I think that's very important to note. And, and we need to have that discussion as well. Who actually should be included in this? Is it individual neighborhoods? Is it distance from the downtown? Um, and I think that that's what requires a lot more discussion here. So I would agree that a work session um, would be important for this council to have to discuss this further. Councilor Tabor. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Moreau and, and <laughs> Councillor Bagley. It does seem like we are moving forward. I think it sounds like we don't want to continue the free pilot program forever. We, we want to sunset that. And the question is, what do we put in its place? And the issues we've identified are what percent of the neighborhood has to want to participate to make this the right thing for the whole neighborhood? And um, how do we make this portable to other neighborhoods? Um, I think a work session makes sense. I was going to suggest, you know, we suspend the rules and meet as a committee of the whole to deliberate, but that might keep us here quite late. <laughs> so, um, you know, to me, we should, we should charge the cost of this and it takes a lot of manpower to enforce a two-hour limit uh, or in this case uh, we're gonna Ben Fletcher suggests automating it which gets gets it much more streamlined but it still takes manpower um, my concern has always been let's say that less than 50 percent in the end of the day want to pay 125 dollars a year um, then you've got a situation where a majority of the residents are going to have to uh, have their parking metered uh, because a minority of the residents want to have a parking permit program. Um, and as, as Councillor Bagley points out, even if you do 65-35, that's still 35 percent of the people who uh, will have to uh, pay for a permit on top of their taxes that they don't really want. Um, so I think we have to proceed carefully. To me, we shouldn't, uh, had it come to the fee committee, I would have suggested we set the price at $125. If we get above 50%, we move ahead. If we get below 50%, we don't move ahead. Um, and 
but I think Councilor Moreau's on the right track of there are other neighborhoods that wouldn't want to do this. We may want to do it as a way to allow housing density to grow. And so let's we should talk in length, at length about what's the threshold as a percent of a neighborhood. And um, and do we implement the way Director Fletcher suggests, simply using the app, which seems to be very streamlined and efficient? Councillor Dutton. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, quick comment and then a question for work session if it's set. The uh, comment is on, I believe it was the 2000. 18 to 20 council which set the 75 percent threshold for the pilot program to begin and that was incredibly controversial and tough for the neighborhood to actually accomplish and so i do like the idea of lowering it um obviously more than 50 percent so the 65 percent makes good sense but the question i'd have for the work session is would it remain open to anyone in the city to buy into it to park there or to just be for the neighborhood but again, that's a question for the work session. So it seems like we need a date for this work session before December 4th. Um, is that correct? Is that a correct assumption here? Or Councilor Bagley? Uh, thank you, Your Honor. So there are two ways to look at this. Um, one, we would want to seamlessly transition into a uh, neighborhood parking program. There's a second way to look at this. Um, because of COVID and because the neighborhood has been, let's say, uh, unusual parking characteristics for so long, that if there was a period where there was no neighborhood parking program, it would give a chance for residents to reacquaint themselves with what the parking situation was uh, before the neighborhood parking program. It would give new residents also a chance to reacquaint themselves uh, kind of the pros and cons of we had the program, now we don't have the program. It's been, say, six months. Let's evaluate if we want to pay a fee and have the program come back or if we're happy with the current parking situation. So I, I guess I could see um, there's a case to be made that we should have a seamless transition to a parking program if that's what we're going to do. But I think there's an equally valid case to be made that it might be nice to have uh, the opportunity for the neighborhood to see what it's like without a parking program for a little bit. Okay. I guess to see those both options and debate those both options would, would require at least the first work session. And I am super optimistic to think that we're going to, we're after whatever, five years, we're going to figure it all out in one night, some Rochambeau and Conference Rome, uh, and, and, and get it done. But um, I, would, I would hope that we could have at least the first um, conversation around this, regardless of whether or not we decide to move forward or not before the parking program is officially ended because otherwise it kind of seems like we took the vote to allow it to expire and then did nothing um, for that. And I could see where people might uh, want to share their opinion on, on that before we do. Councillor Cook. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, I share your concern. Um, I'm also concerned about um, not having the discussion before December 4th because we might incur costs um, to the city by having to do sign removal um, as of December 4th, and if we are planning to extend anything beyond that, it would be better not to have to remove signs and then put them back. So um, can we, I don't know if we, all of the schedule's up right now, um, but we could pull the council uh, tomorrow and publicly notice the, the work session uh, to be held at some point in uh, November, I would say, would be a, so could we have a, a motion to schedule a work session at a uh, at date in November? So moved. Second. Okay. I will uh, uh, support this. Um, I think the uh, wonder sometimes why we can't meter it and then allow people to buy in on the meter, you know, just uh, because I, the, the problem for me in this conversation is, you know, I definitely hear the folks that, that say, hey, it's not worth it. You know, I don't want this, not in my neighborhood. And I appreciate that, but I can't just listen. I don't think we can just listen to, to you because I do 
uh, take uh, Councillor Bagley's point. It's a point that I've made um, uh, before myself that that parking and housing are inextricably linked when it comes to the enjoyment that people have with their current housing. And one of the biggest oppositions to more housing is more parking and more cars. Mm -hmm. And we aren't going to get things done in the city by asking people to sacrifice their way of life for our future way of life for more people. We have to figure out how do we bridge that gap so that we can make a transition. We were a city that transitioned to cars and figured all of that out. I would like to, fig I would like to believe that we're a city that can go back to less cars there or at least adequately account for the cost of, of owning a car in the downtown. So I look forward to the work session. I hope we can figure it out, not for the Islington Creek, although I do hope we can do that, uh, but to create a, uh, an opportunity to have something uh, for the, uh, the entirety, uh, or it could be applied to the entirety of, of Portsmouth because we will have these problems everywhere in Portsmouth so long as that we want to, uh, to, to continue to have you know, more neighbors, continue to have our children be able to stay uh, in the city uh, without uh, necessarily you know, sacrificing what we all love about it, and that's you know, being able to live you know, as, a custom, as we're accustomed to do so. Um, so with that, uh, uh, we can, uh, I guess it's just a work session. So uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Thank you, guys. All right. We thought we were moving off of Councillor Bagley. You were wrong. <laughs> Go back to Councillor Bagley. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, so I'm not going to make a motion tonight, but I did want to highlight if I can get to it, um, public comment, and for several reasons. Um, the first being, if you go to um, Rule 43, public comment session, part of our rules are all speakers must register in person, not electronically or telephonically, with a city clerk prior to the city council meeting. Um, I think we can all agree that that rule is uh, certainly outdated and should either be stricken or changed. Um, it would be, it'd be quite silly for us to allow people to speak remotely on Zoom, but force them to drive down to City Hall uh, before they speak remotely. It kind of counteracts um, you know, the intent of, of letting them speak remotely. So that's the first thing. But the, the second thing, and I think, and I thank the mayor um, for his comment earlier before we spoke tonight, is in the state of New Hampshire, there's no requirement to have public comment at city council meetings. Unless it's a public hearing, which typically has to do with uh, zoning, then there's some legal requirements. But, but this opportunity to come and address the council for three minutes at the start of the meeting is uh, not a right. It's a, um, I guess it was Assistant Mayor Jim Splain that, that first brought it uh, forward a privilege. Uh, decades ago. That being said, I would say, uh, certainly speaking for myself, but probably speaking for others, that it's become a, almost akin to a right. Uh, I, I think this council's made it uh, quite clear that we want to hear from the residents, we want to get feedback from the residents, we want to get input from the residents. And if you take a look at the, the history of the First Amendment, um, originally it only had to do with uh, what Congress enacted or didn't enact. And it wasn't until about 1917 when the Supreme Court looked at um, the right to due process that's in, I believe, the Fourth and Seventeenth Amendments um, and started expanding it. And interestingly enough, in the uh, New Hampshire Constitution, there's a right uh, for newspapers, and it was supposed to say, and for free speech. Uh, but it wasn't until the 1950s, I believe, that we went back and amended it because somehow it got overlooked. So the right to free speech in New Hampshire on the New Hampshire constitutional level is relatively recent. But it is a right. And so what happens is once you've created the ability for the public to speak at a meeting, um, you can regulate certain things. You can regulate the time that they speak. Um, you can regulate um, the fact that when we have public comment, it is one way. And by that, what I mean is uh, when the public is speaking to us, and this frustrates new speakers a lot. We, we generally try not to respond. Um, 
because it's a very slippery slope. Uh, if if we shake our heads or raise our hands or um, really interact in any way on one question, then we have to on all questions. And, and uh, to be frank, sometimes people come up here and, and they speak about things that um, either we have no knowledge of or we wouldn't even know how to respond because they're they're outside of our areas of expertise. So the best practice is, is that when people speak in public comment, they're spoken, they speak, we don't respond, uh, the person running the meeting thanks them for their comments, whether they agree with them or not, and then we move on to the next speaker. So all that being said, I, I think the mayor captured um, the primary reason I wanted to bring this forward, and, and that's just because we can say anything that we want to, um, doesn't mean that we have to. And, and I think for a reasonable person to come up here and and to, you know, say they don't agree with the mayor or, or say they don't agree with me as a counselor, you know, obviously I, I don't like to hear that, but um, I appreciate it. What we can't regulate, um, is when they attack uh, a city employee or a city resident or um, frequently uh, former President Obama's uh, purchase of real estate in Martha's Vineyard has been a big discussion. There are three minutes they can more or less talk about anything they want. Um, we can ask them to respectfully uh, honor the chamber and keep their topics relevant to Portsmouth and to keep them less personal and more um, issue oriented. Uh, but the reality is, is uh, there's not much we can do. So I, I guess what I'd like to see us do is revise rule 43 to um, allow for remote speaking, uh, codify that, and to um, express what our desires as a council are for people when they address the council and speak to the council, uh, but certainly not to limit um, those expressions and and what they say. So that was a bit long-winded, but uh, I've put a lot of time and research into this, and and I think it's it's a tricky issue. Um, but if if we allow people to to come up and speak, and and they just are very insulting to to residents, to to citizens, to to employees of the city, that's not fostering. Uh, a healthy environment um, and I don't think we ever want to get to the point where we don't have public comment at meetings anymore but I do think we want to and, and maybe we could do this we could start public comment as the mayor did tonight with with a quick outline of the rules for people that maybe it's their first time speaking and, and also a, a gentle reminder to people um, that you know in politics our, our tempers get pretty heated uh, but if we can stick to the issues instead of the personalities, uh, we're all better off for it. Thank you, Councillor Bagley. Any other discussion on this topic? Councillor Tabor. Uh, yeah, the, thank you, Mayor. Um, here's some things I think we should value about public comment. Um, we have a lot of uh, interests, moneyed interests that can hire people, former mayors, for example, to lobby us. They can hire attorneys to speak for them. Public comment, any person in this city can come up and have equal standing as those, as those owners of capital, if you want to call them that. Um, and I think years ago, Mayor, one of, Mayor Sorrell, I think, said the rule of 10. If 10 people come to speak on an issue, then you know it's, it's got to be reconsidered or, or thought about carefully. I, at the time I heard that, I said, that's crazy. That's not a real valid sample at all. But if it's 10 people whose life experience is directly affected by an issue, we're hearing from their point of view of how they live with that decision. And that, I think, is, is really valuable. Um, past councils have tried to limit public comment or change it, and I th think they've, uh, they've reaped the consequences of that. Uh, it is an institution. Um, 
So uh, I think we should continue it. I think we should modify it for the electronic age. Um, I don't think we should um, try to encumber it with too many rules because we can't. Um, and I think we should expect criticism. If we're not getting criticized, we're not doing enough. You know? Um, it's easy to not be criticized. You don't make any decisions. You don't stick your neck out. You don't do anything. You don't stand for anything. Well, I don't think that's what this council wants to do. And everything we do will affect some party. And we need them to come speak of their lived experience and hear that. Um, and lastly, on the difference between us and city employees, you know, the test for libel, which is really what are the limits of free speech, uh, for us as public figures, for somebody to libel us, they have to knowingly and maliciously make false statements. That's a very high bar. But, you know, the rest is fair game. And we know that when we run for office. Uh, we're not going to get a bouquets thrown at our feet all the time at all. Uh, <laughs> so, but city staff is different. They're not public figures. So I think speakers who want to criticize city staff they have to understand that these are uh, people doing, serving the public as their job, and they don't run for office. They don't have to meet this high test for criticism. In fact, no one should ever, I think, criticize our em city employees uh, if they don't know their facts, because that is libel. And that's, we can't permit that. So. Thank you, Councilor Tabor. Councilor Murrow. I'd just like to reiterate Councilor Tabor's thoughts regarding us as city councilors that we, you know, as, as my husband likes to remind me all the time, you asked for that job. So. <laughs> Funny. My wife says the same thing. <laughs> I get that all the time when I want to say something, but you asked for it, um, which is all fine. And, and you want to criti criticize me? I mean, our bosses are the um, citizens of the city, so they can criticize us. But when it comes to the employees, they absolutely can't criticize them publicly. They are, if there's an employee that's doing something wrong, I know that their superior or the city manager would want to know about it right away. In which case, you know, that's the direction that they, sh a, a citizen should go, is to actually look for the person that's in charge of that person. And if that person is the city manager, then they can come to us. And they don't need to come to us, you know, publicly. They can come to us individually. It doesn't matter. But that's that's the direction. If you're going to publicly criticize people, it should just be the councilors of this chamber. But that's just my thoughts. Councilor Cook. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I agree with uh, what has been said so far. Um, I want to reiterate something that Councilor Moreau just said, and I think this is really important. Um, the council has no authority over. Um, decisions with regard to employees of the city except for the city manager. So we hire the city manager. Manager, We're responsible for the city manager. Um, if there are problems with employees or perceived problems, that discussion should be between a resident and the city manager. It shouldn't come before the council. The council has no authority to take any action regarding a city employee. And when you come to public comment in front of the council, um, we're happy to take criticism. I think it's really important. Um, I especially like to hear the criticism because then I learn. Uh, I learn from our residents. I learn what is important to them. But we shouldn't be criticizing employees in this chamber. It is libelous to do so. Um, I think it's critical to remember what the purpose is of public comment, and it's to bring issues before the council on matters that the council can actually take action. Thank you, Councillor Cook. Um, I appreciate uh, 
Councillor Bagley, uh, bringing this uh, to the attention. Um, I had honestly had no I had thought that public comment was, you know, that literally started 400 years ago, you know. Um, I was surprised to find that Councillor, uh, at the time, uh, then later Assistant Mayor uh, Splain, Jim Splain, uh, was the one uh, to bring it forth about 17 or so years ago, at least according to former uh, City Attorney uh, Bob Sullivan. Um, you know, I, I caution against making um, uh, too many rules uh, on, you know, trying to direct the type of speech that we receive, um, mostly because it's tough to make rules. It's really tough. It's tough to like limit things and 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 not account for things, as evident by the fact that we now have Zoom communication, and and a pandemic has created the ability to to call in from the uh, the, the the future here, um, and and be a member of, of public comment, which is incredibly important because not everybody can come down and have public comment when we you know they might be putting their kids to bed, but we still want to hear from them. So. I, I also want to, you know, there are rules of which it's a council we could agree that somebody is, has lost the privilege um, to, to have that. Um, and that would take a vote of the council uh, and a super majority and not place that on, on me. I certainly would not want that uh, responsibility. I do have the right to remove anybody that's disrupting uh, a meeting. Um, but we, I think, will be well to, to, to align towards uh, more comment uh, and 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 not less uh, to remind folks that the city employees do not work for them. Uh, they work they work uh, through the council uh, for the city, uh, but they work for our city manager Karen Cunard, um, and she doesn't uh, get to get to weigh in because public comment. I have the gavel, um, but I think I would speak for her and say if there's a problem with the the city, it should be. Addressed to us on the on the dais, uh, and not folks uh, watching at home. Um, and and I think that as long as we can keep it to to that, I, I feel like uh, you know the modifications that we need to make, we can uh, we can review those uh, to come in line with the 21st century, um, and look towards uh, you know recommitting to make sure uh, public dialogue is respected. And I just will say that there's been many times. People that I don't necessarily always agree with have made points that I have reflected upon. And those points are often more effective when they come from a standpoint of, hey, you should consider this. Not, you know, um, but that's just effective communication. We're always listening um, up here. And I think we've made many attempts to, to change things based on things that we've heard from comments uh, or delayed votes or gone back to tabling second readings, uh, et cetera. But I appreciate this discussion. And, and thank you again, Councillor Bagley. I'm, I'm glad there's to, something we can, we got to formally recognize it as the assistant mayor's um, uh, gift to Portsmouth in, in some way uh, for um, the, uh, the, the work that uh, Jim Splain done. He's always tried to get uh, equal, well, even the playing field for the resident uh, and those that have had more opportunity to communicate, as Councillor Tabor said. So thank you, assistant mayor, if you're watching, or former assistant mayor, if you're watching at home. So. With that, we go to Councillor Cook. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, I have two items under my name, but technically they're really the same item. It's two different policies, you'll see, but um, they really should be presented together, and you'll understand why. The, the first policy, 2014-2, um, is our po policy regarding public art. And this came forward from Governance Committee, the recommendation to delete this policy. But it's not, a, it's not a standalone deletion. That policy goes into the second policy that we're looking at tonight, um, which is 2000, which would, would be a new policy um, from 2009-06. It would change to 2022 whatever if we adopt it, and we take the the exact language from the first policy and insert it in the second. And the reason that um, governance is recommending that we do that is we have two different public art policies. Um, currently, we have a, a policy regarding public art and then a public art acquisition policy. By combining the two, um, it's much more efficient. Um, it's easier for people to find one policy than finding two, and really they're relevant to each other. So uh, 
the governance committee recommends that we delete the first policy, the policy regarding public art, take the language, and essentially it would go into paragraph three of the second policy. Um, and the second policy would have additional amendments. Those amendments would be um, related to removing language around referrals to art speak, which no longer exists for public art, and establishing a standing committee for public art review, which we saw earlier when uh, governance presented uh, the public art review committee um, draft ordinance to the council. So that would be the standing committee that's referenced here. And then the references to art speak are removed later as well in the second policy, and it's just referred to as the committee. Um, there, is, there are two other clarifications um, in the change, and the first one is removing the word must and making it shall um, include a cash stewardship donation. Um, that change is to allow a little more wiggle room for the council, not a lot, um, because art donations should come with um, uh, ten percent of the cost of the artwork for maintenance but this would allow the council to have enough room without um, suspending a policy to accept say a donation from a very famous artist um, wanting to donate a public sculpture to the city of Portsmouth um, or um, an, another donation that somebody else may want to donate maintenance costs for um, and then um, under suitable donations um, as far as uh, that's paragraph, um, well, I guess it would be paragraph seven. Um, suitable, suitable donations will be accepted unconditionally. Um, you'll see at the very bottom of that paragraph, there's an additional language on removal and allowing, to, allowing us to remove deteriorated pieces of art, not just for repair or conser conservation, or for, but for, or for other good cause. So those are the changes in the second policy. Um, I'm not making a motion immediately to take any action here. I wanted to get the sense from the council first on how we should proceed. I believe that these changes can occur without adoption of the ordinance, but I don't want to prejudge whether or not the council is adopting the ordinance. So I'm happy to either discuss these changes occurring tonight or having them introduced to come with third and final reading of the ordinance changes as well. Okay. Does that make sense? I think so. So either we could do this as a cleanup to thumb things separate than the ordinance changes that are on the books, mm -hmm. uh, or uh, just lump them into the ordinance changes that are already scheduled for second reading now, correct? Right. They wouldn't have to be discussed um, because they're not ordinance changes. They don't have to go through second reading. But we could bring back the policy changes at the same time as third reading so that everything is adopted at the same time if that's the preference of the council. I think if uh, the only preference that I have is if we could just make uh, ask for one sample motion that would be to uh, move to delete city council policy uh, uh, 2014-2014. 02 regarding public art and uh, adopt uh, city council policy 2022-2 uh, regarding public art uh, referral and art acquisition policy. Just have one motion. I don't. Is that see. reasonable? Okay. Um, I think you want someone to say. So yeah, I would get yeah, some. Yeah. <laughs> A second. Okay. Any discussion on that? I don't see any issue that we would not do this, Councilor Bailey. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you, Councilor Cook. I think this all is clean up. I think this all prevents, um, you know, us missing little steps. I like the idea of the shall instead of the must, um, but I think this is all just going to encourage more art. Yeah. Any comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you, Councilor Cook. Thank you. All right. Approval of grants and donations. Uh, acceptance of donation to the cemeteries uh, from Valerie Cunningham in memory of Esther Whipple uh, Moenal. Uh, sample motion moved to approve and or uh, wait a motion to approve and accept the donation as presented. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Acceptance of donation to cemeteries from Karen McDonald of $150. Uh, Wait a motion to approve and accept the donation to the cemeteries. So moved. moved. 
Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, there's uh, New Hampshire State Library Moose Plate Conservation Grant in the amount of $9,692. I'd wait a motion to approve and accept the grant from the New Hampshire State Library in the amount of $9,682. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, an acceptance of donation from the fire department in the amount of $300. I'd accept the motion to move and approve. Uh, Move to approve and accept the donation as presented. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And this one's a little bit bigger. <laughs> um, so uh, an acceptance of a housing navigator grant in the amount of two hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars. Sample or a uh, way to motion to approve and accept the grant as presented. So, so moved. moved. Second. Second. And is there any discussion? <laughs> <laughs> End up a little higher. I've been so excited about us getting this this grant. Um, so I would just like to start by saying, for those that don't know, the ha Community Housing Navigator uh, grant was uh, through the New Hampshire Housing and the whole New Hampshire Invest Fund, which came out of the governor's money that he set aside. Uh, which is all in there. Um, and I just like to give a lot of kudos to uh, our planning director, Beverly Zen, who spent a lot of time because I threw this at her with a week for her to draft it up and, and get us this award. But I think in the end, it's going to work hand in hand. For the next two years, we will be able to hire somebody whose sole job is to work on everything housing which is one of the big things we talked about as setting a goal. So I think this is going to be very helpful for the next two years to have somebody that not only can help planning, but I sort of see this person as really being an, a help to educate the community, to reach out to the community, getting feedback for us, and really being that go-between. So I'm super excited, and thank you to our planning director for doing such an awesome job in getting us this money. This is awesome. Thank you, Beverly. <laughs> Any other comments? No, uh, it's a great job. The, there's a, not a surprising, but the toughest calls you, that you, you get on the council or as, as mayor, uh, assistant mayor, I'm sure gets a lot, the, um, is when people are out of housing or they're trying to navigate the system of housing um, and they reach out to their to their government and they say, hey, I need I need help. Um, there is, you know, we have a, a great staff that tries to piece some of that together. Um, but it's often, you know, helping people find legal assistance or legal aid. You know, having somebody that's not only, um, you know, dedicated in how do we can navigate this crisis together, uh, but on the acute problems where somebody is in distress uh, and needs um, a hand to to walk them through what is, you know, finding housing and, and you know, uh, temporary housing. That's something you don't, you know, you know, people don't get good at that because it's sometimes a, a a life change that is really hard to. You know, a lot is thrown at them. So I'm so excited about the big picture, but also those small conversations that we can have. So thank you, uh, Beverly, and, and thank you, Council Moreau. City Manager. Yes, sir. Oh, we didn't vote. Oh, we got a vote. Yeah, we, we actually have to vote to accept it so we can hire this person. I guess we should vote. <laughs> and now thank you, Kelly, for reminding us to accept the two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Just not to get excited so we're, to talk about it. We're going to leave on the table. Um, all right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. <laughs> Any opposed? <laughs> All right. City Manager, some three, informational three items. Three quick informational items, uh, two of which are verbal, and the middle one which I'll dispatch with first, which is a, a Household Hazardous Waste Collection Day, which will be held on Saturday, November 12th. There's a press release in your packet, and we're doing our best to spread the word far and wide. Um, as promised, I always give a verbal McIntyre update at each council meeting. We are excited. We are past the 50% design stage. We have led tours of general contractors to provide cost estimating through the building. So if you've seen people out and about around the building in the last few days, that's what's going on. We expect as many as five estimates back, due back in the middle of November, which will help um, get to the $64 question of what will this cost to build. I hope it's a $64 question. <laughs> <laughs> that would be it's great. Actually 64. Yeah, oh. it's, it's, we've had our, uh, our third regular check-in, which we have every 45 days with the GSA. We had it last Friday, went well. And we're still aiming for a December council vote to approve a submission of a packet to the National Park Service. So uh, that is the McIntyre update. Happy to answer any questions. Any questions from the council? 
Look and forward to that meeting. Thank you. And the third uh, and final info item I have is you'll recall that at a previous meeting, uh, Mr. Peter Weeks, on behalf of the Worth Condominium Association, was looking to have a matter resolved and to make a presentation in front of the council. I'm happy to report that we've solved the matter administratively. The city and the condo association have come to an agreement for the monthly rate and hours of enforcement for those reserved spaces for the remainder of the term, which I believe is nine years. Mr. Weeks, on behalf of the condo association, does not need to make a presentation. Um, both parties are satisfied, and uh, as such, that's the report back. And um, happy to answer any questions, and that's all I have this evening. Thank you. Thanks, city manager. Um, anything? I have one um, item under miscellaneous, um, but I will be uh, asking uh, Councillor Denton, Councillor Moreau, uh, and Councillor Tabor uh, to serve on the newly formed uh, audit committee. I will be asking Councillor Tabor uh, to be the chair. I uh, will accept the, uh, the uh, standing aside of, of Councillor Cook, who has uh, put an enormous amount of time into the audit committee and appreciate uh, all the work that, that you've done. Uh, on that and look forward to going through the RFP uh, process and getting a report back. Councillor Blaylock. All right, we're doing miscellaneous items. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, I just wanted to let everyone know the recreational needs uh, study um, input session is November 16th at the community campus at 6 o'clock. That's uh, November 16th. That's a Wednesday at 6 o'clock, and we hope for a good turnout. Thank so you. this is your chance to ask um, for any recreational needs in Portsmouth. Portsmouth. And just so you know, if you haven't paid attention at all, that should not preclude you from coming out. You know, there's some of the people that we want to hear from, especially that are just coming like, hey, there's a need study? Yes. The more the merrier. The more people come out, the more effective the study is. Yeah. So. Thank you, Councilor, Councilor Cook. And thank you, Your Honor. Um, uh, the city manager sent out a, a press release on October 3rd, and I wanted to make sure that that we highlighted um, the importance of this press release. Um, it was to announce the awards from the Government Finance Officer, Officers Association for our finance department for the 29th year in a row, our Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting. Um, I think it's really critical that we recognize just how outstanding our finance director is and her, and her team. They also won an additional award, this is uh, for the fifth time, outstanding achievement for popular annual financial reporting. And the reason this is only the fifth time is they didn't even start pr producing what we call the PAFR until 2016. So um, we have an outstanding finance department. I think it's really important we recognize the fantastic work they've been doing. Thank you, Councilor. Thank you, Councilor. Oh, yeah, just just a, a quick question is um, I've had uh, questions from several people actually about uh, the um, Sherburn School and when the Lister Academy is completely out of there, um, is there is there a uh, public session um, about the what's going to happen with that? Uh, planned there needs to be for sure yeah uh, what's uncertain is the date um, by which they the school department no longer needs educational use of that building right so um, we can uh, we can schedule a, uh, a, a work session there I thought we had had if we'd not okay um, then we should uh, schedule a work session for that uh, what's tricky about not tricky but um, so the school has to uh, we own the building. The school can stay there as long as they want. Uh, we can't ask the school to uh, relinquish a building. It's their, as I understand, their intention to do so. Um, but we would need to, um, we'd have a work session. And if we wanted to align to any uses of the campus that uh, would need um, authorization to entry uh, to start with, we would need to have that done uh, pretty quickly. So um, if we could accept a motion. Or, Assistant Mayor, did I you would, I would, um, before we potentially set a motion to set a, um, a, a meeting, a work, work session, session yeah. yes, uh, could we maybe have a motion to get a report back from the school department in the school board on the timeline to, that they're looking at proposed? 
my, my concern is that if we set a work session for potential of Lister Academy, and then the school board and, and the school department comes back and says, we're looking at a year and a half to two years out before full transition, and you, do you know what I mean? I, sure. I don't want us to get too yeah. far ahead in the mind of the community of what could go there before we've, we've had a conversation or some dialogue with the, the school department public facing for the council. What is the last, um, we can certainly get that, uh, but what was the last, uh, what was the last vote that the school board took on this? I'm trying to remember it. That I believe at the point in time when they no longer, when, when they no longer were planning to hold the Lister Academy at Sherman School, that they would therefore have no further educational use for the building, but they were not comfortable giving an end date, as I recall. Yeah. So I think that, um, I don't know if we're going to get an end date uh, yet, and I don't want to put the, the school board on the on the spot. I think that we should have a um, um, a work session. Uh, happy to, yeah. Let's. Um, this is probably a bigger conversation than miscellaneous at the yeah. end of the night. So uh, <laughs> yes, we yes. wait until the 14th to uh, decide. Uh, what to do, and we will work uh, administratively uh, through the school department to find any information uh, before that date. But yeah, that's probably can't do that at at, uh, at ten o'clock with the Patriots on. I don't think anybody is watching <laughs> right now. We're watching us. I, I hope. I hope nobody. I hope, I hope nobody's watching us. Uh, I'm here. recording it. So. All right. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, and I, uh, uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. All in favor? Aye. All right. Good night, Fort Smith.